Good evening and welcome to the March 13, 2023 meeting of the Menlo Park Planning Commission. I am Acting Chair Cynthia Harris and I would like to thank you for joining us this evening, either here in the council chambers or on Zoom. I'm calling this meeting to order and I would first like to take the role of the commissioners, which I will do in alphabetical order. Commissioner Doe. Present, good evening. Commissioner Riggs. Uh, present. Commissioner Schindler. Present. Commissioner Tate. Present. And I am here as well. So we have five commissioners present, four in person, and a quorum to continue. So we'll move on to C on the agenda, which is um, a reports and announcements. Ms. Sandmeyer, uh, would you like to provide us any reports and announcements? Uh, yes, good evening, uh, Acting Chair Harris and Commissioners. Um, so tomorrow uh, evening at the City Council, we'll have a number of um, planning related items. We have the 201 El Camino Real tentative map extension um, that the Planning Commission recommended approval of to the City Council. We have the SB9 um, Municipal Code Amendments, and those are two titles, 15 and 16. And the Parkline Project, which is the redevelopment of the SRI campus, um, that project will be at City Council for the Council to receive an overview of the comments received on the NOP and the EIR, um, which is on the EIR scope. So, that those comments are summarized in the staff report and we have a comment matrix attached and then um, the council will also be making a recommendation and on an agreement with the applicant um, to process the application under SB7. And that concludes my reports and announcements, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions from commissioners for Ms. Sandmeyer at this time? Okay, so let's move on to item D, which is public comment. Um, I think uh, Mr. Turner is our clerk for this evening. Is that correct? That is correct. I'm here. Okay. Thank you. So under public comment, the public may address the commission on any subject that is not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. You are not required to provide your name or city of residence, but it is helpful. The commission cannot act on items that are not listed on the agenda, and therefore the commission cannot respond to non-agenda items that are brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. So if uh, Mr. Turner, you could explain how uh, folks may provide public comment. Um, yes, so we are in a hybrid setting. We have quite a few in-person um, attendees here. Um, so during the public comment period, um, as Commissioner Harris stated, you'll have an opportunity to speak for um, three minutes. If you're participating via Zoom, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen and that will indicate that you have um, it, that you would like to give public comment. If you are calling in to tonight's meeting, please click star nine on your phone and that will also indicate that you have a comment. Um, for those participating in person, if you can go ahead and fill out a comment card, uh, which are located in the back of the room, um, that would be greatly appreciated and would help us move along on public comment. Um, I'll start with the online uh, participants today, um, just to give an opportunity for those to, to fill out comment cards, um, and then I'll move uh, on. Mr. Excuse me, Mr. Turner. I just want to remind everyone in the public that this is only for items that are not on the agenda. If you come here tonight to discuss one of the items that is on the agenda, you will have a chance to do that later. So this is only for those items that are not on the agenda. 
All right, sorry for the interruption, Mr. Turner. Are there any hands? No worries. Um, yes, there is There is one hand, and I know we have one uh, comment card. So I will um, start with Ron Schloss uh, on Zoom. And Ron, you should be able to unmute yourself um, now. Yeah. Hello, I'm, I'm Ron Schloss. Um, I'm assuming you can hear me. Okay. I live on Sand Hill Circle and uh, I have a proposal and a question. When I moved on to Sand Hill Circle a number of years ago, the speed limit was 15 miles an hour. It is now a very, I perceive, a very dangerous 25 miles an hour. And I was wondering who I would speak to or what I would do to get the city to look at uh, bringing the speed back to speed limit back to its original 15 miles an hour. I know we don't have to solve it here, but what what would be the steps that I would take? Okay, Mr. Schloss, is that the end of your comments or did you, you said you had a proposal and a question? Well, the proposal is, yeah, yeah, let's, the pro proposal would be to lower the speed limit on Sand Hill Circle from 25 miles an hour to, to return the speed limit on Sand Hill Circle to its original 15 miles an hour based on the number of pedestrians, the number of senior people walking around the circle, the number of children, and the, the number of pets, as well as the whole circle is just one blind corner. Okay, thank you for your comment. Um, this seems like a question that we could easily answer, even though it's not on the agenda, if somebody from staff would like to um, answer Mr. Schloss's question. I assume that he could write into the city council. Um, yeah, through the chair, I, I suppose that's one option. Um, if we have his contact information, we can also find the correct person um, correct staff person to address the, the comment to. Thank you. Do we have any more commenters, Mr. Turner? Yes, we have, uh, our next speaker will be Kenneth Doe. He's in person. Hello, okay. Good evening, Planning Commissioner. My name is Kenneth Doe. I'm a field rep for the Carpenters Union here in San Mateo County at Local Union 217. Tonight, I want to speak to you about the need for labor standard, standard we all need that will help the working class like most of us blue collar workers in construction. With labor standard comes a commitment to apprenticeship program to guarantee we have an experienced workforce to complete high quality project in a safe and timely manner. A livable wage with medical and retirement benefits allows workers and their families to live in the community they work in. This also means those wages will be reinvested back into the local community as they spend their uh, tax dollars will help fund local school and government. Projects that invest in apprenticeship, prevailing wage, and health care are the best deals for workers and the community. The peninsula needs more trained construction workers to meet the demand for the new housing and major public infrastructure projects that are in the pipeline. Labor standard will ensure contractors pay fair wage, use experienced and well-trained workers. This leads to higher quality workmanship, meeting building standards and completing the project quickly. Menlo Park should be set an example and be the standard of what's doing right for blue collar family. We would love to have a real and valuable meeting with each and every one of you to answer questions you might have about what labor violation is and what labor standards should look like. Um, for all these reasons, the carpenter urges Menlo Park to adopt labor standard as a requirement for any developers and uh, contractors planning to build in our city. Um, thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, at this time, I do not see any more hands raised online and do not have any more comment cards. Okay. I will close public comment now and move on to item E on our agenda, which is uh, the consent calendar. We have two items on the consent calendar. Uh, they are both minutes, minutes from November 14th and December 1st, 2022 planning commission meetings. Would any of the commissioners wish to pull either of these items? Okay, I don't see any hands. So in that case, could I get a motion from one of the commissioners to approve the consent calendar? Commissioner Doe, thank you. Make a motion to approve. Thank you, Commissioner Doe. Do I have a second? I'll second the motion. Thank you, Commissioner Schindler. So let's take a vote. Uh, Commissioner Doe? Yes. Commissioner Riggs? Abstain. Commissioner Schindler? Yes. Commissioner Tate? I'm also abstaining. Okay. Um, and I am a yes. So uh, that gives three, uh, no, three yeses and two abstentions. Um, so I, does the motion pass with three or do we need a quorum? Yes, three passes since it's the majority of the commissioners present. Okay, so the motion passes, thank you. So we're gonna move on to the public hearing um, item F and we have two on tonight's agenda. The first one is F1, which is a use permit for 893 Woodland Avenue. And let me read, um, let me read from the <clears throat> staff agenda. Uh, we're going to consider and adopt a resolution to approve a use permit to demolish an existing one story single family residence and construct a new two story residence on a substandard lot with regard to the minimum lot width in the R1U, that's Single Family Urban Residential Zoning District, at 893 Woodland Avenue, determine this action is categorically exempt under CEQA guidelines section 15303's class three exemption for new construction or conversion of small structures. Do we have um, the applicant who might wish to make a presentation or staff. Good evening, Acting Chair Harris and Planning Commissioners and members of the public. Um, staff does have an update to the project. Staff has received a, a letter from a concerned neighbor after publication of the staff report shared with the Planning Commissioners earlier today. The applicant and property owners are available to answer any questions uh, from the commissioners and also to introduce the project. Additionally, the applicant has provided me with a material sheet which I would like to share with the commissioners. With that, I conclude my updates. Thank you. Okay, um, so you're going to share this first and then we'll hear from the applicant? Yes, uh, unfortunately, uh, Acting Chair Harris, it is a physical copy, so I do not know how to share that with you virtually. Okay, um, is it something that you can summarize? Um, I would request the applicant to come towards the dais and maybe hold up the printed version for you to see, as well as uh, any others joining us virtually this evening. Okay, thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, 
Good evening, uh, Commissioner, uh, and uh, this is Leo. I'm the designer of this uh, uh, two-story brand new house. And uh, the pro proposed new house uh, is designed to close to the existing uh, house footprint and with one, one car garage, uh, attached garage. And uh, we provide a big backyard with more green areas with the, uh, nice redwood trees along the uh, rear property line to give a better buffer, green buffer in between neighbors to our uh, new proposed house. The design is carefully designed to reflect the transitional modern style, which combined with the pitch, shared roof, and the flat roofs. I used a, a combination of the stucco and the wood siding material finish. And the uh, uh, design reflects the scale and character of the neighbor uh, with the back porch and the welcoming uh, front porch, which soften the building uh, facade and uh, try to break down the, the building mass. Um, doesn't like uh, some uh, contemporary buildings with a big box, just a simply box. We try to break down the mass and uh, uh, introduce uh, different areas to soften the facade of the building. And uh, before the, this, today's meeting, uh, the owner, uh, Joe, has met, uh, met with the seven close by neighbors, adjacent neighbors. And we have two a great meeting with two neighbors, a Zoom meeting, also uh, via the emails to response uh, neighbors' consent. Well, I'm more than happy to answer a question if any, uh, any comments from the neighbor. And uh, during the design revisions, we work briefly with the planner, Fenton, uh, which come up with the current uh, proposed plans. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, presentation. Uh, now I would like to open up this item for public comment. Uh, as a reminder, please raise your virtual hand if you're on Zoom and for those in the chambers, please bring a comment card up to Mr. Turner and anyone speaking will have three minutes to make a comment. Mr. Turner, do we have any hands raised um, or comment cards for this item? At the moment, I do not see any hands raised via Zoom. Um, we do have one comment card for an in-person, um, maybe a second one coming. Um, so I'll call uh, Naomi Goodman up first to give public comment. Um, and then again, if you would like to give public comment via Zoom, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Please Thank you, ahead. commissioners. Um, I wasn't expecting three minutes, so I'm going to have to kind of cut my comments short. Um, I'm Naomi Goodman. I live in the next door house at 897 Woodland. Um, Mark Pierce and I have lived there since 1990. Although I'm not fond of transitional modern, I do appreciate that uh, Ms. Hay and Mr. Lee have kept within the setbacks to the house. Um, I'm sure Ms. Uh, Ms. Hay, being a realtor, knows her market, and the house will find many eager buyers. <laughs> it just doesn't fit with the current neighborhood as it's constructed. Um, I, I'll talk about the first comment first, because that's the one I'm the most concerned about. Menlo Park is charging ahead with electrification of the housing stock, but with very little I'm going to take this off. Very little thought to what that means in terms of neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor conflicts. Um, I did a poll on Nextdoor as to how do you find it living next door to a heat pump. And what came out of that poll was if there's a lot of attention put toward maximizing the quality of the equipment and minimizing the noise levels. People can live next to them with no problem. We live on a very busy street on Woodland. Um, we get a lot of traffic noise. Um, so our backyards are really the only place we can get away from that noise and be outdoors. And I, I am very concerned about day, daytime and nighttime noise, particularly when we have the windows open at night. I have a list of things here that have been found to reduce noise. Number one is just don't buy the cheapest units. 
by a variable speed unit with a spec of less than 55 decibels. Decibels are on a logarithmic scale, so if you go from 55 to 65, you're essentially getting 10 times as much noise. Install them on a concrete pad with a rubber spacer to avoid vibration. Point them away from the nearest neighbors, and if necessary, put a soundproof enclosure. So I, I'm suggesting, and I, I really hope that you put into the permit condition something beyond the simple 60 decibels at the fence line in the day and 50 at night, because I don't feel that that's going to be adequate. Um, I don't have much time. I have a number of other considerations here. Uh, please read my letter, and I think that will lay it out pretty clearly. On the other, these are mostly just things I would like the, to be noted in the permit. They're not big problems because we've settled most of them with the designer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Greg Webb. Good evening, Acting Chair and Commissioners. Thank you for making time to consider this application tonight. Uh, I am Greg Webb. I live at 105 Laurel Avenue, which uh, is adjacent to 893 Woodland. And 893 Woodland actually looks directly into my ba master bathroom and master bedroom in my backyard. And I submitted, um, my wife and I submitted comments last June, but I understand that those unfortunately didn't make it into the final planning staff report. Um, and so those are the comments that were alluded to earlier that uh, were submitted today along with some supplemental comments. Um, in those comments, we basically detail three concerns, and they boil down to trees, privacy, and noise and light pollution. For the trees, there are three heritage redwoods on the 893 woodland lot, and those are also very close to our backyard, and they're beautiful trees. They're truly diamonds of the neighborhood. We appreciate and thank the planning staff and the developer for engaging uh, in a thorough arborist report, and we would just request that all of the um, conditions and protections for those trees that are set forth in the arborist report are carried through into the plan conditions. On privacy, the right side of the house under the current plans has two windows that would look directly into my master bathroom and my master bedroom. And I would just respectfully ask that as part of the plan conditions, there be a mitigation requirement for those windows. And we had a conversation with the developer and her architect immediately prior to this meeting, and they suggested that they would be willing to make the lower half of those windows on the second story opaque. And we would just request that that be built into the plan commission, uh, excuse me, the plan um, conditions in the final plan. And then for noise pollution, we would just echo um, what our, our neighbor who preceded me um, said regarding the heat pump mitigation measures and ask that those be included in the final plan conditions as well. And on light pollution, as you can imagine with a two-story house facing the backside of our house, there is a high probability for a significant amount of light pollution. So we would ask that there be mitigation steps built into the plan, into the final plan conditions to ensure that there's not an excessive amount of light put forth from the rear of the house, including having light fixtures pointing down, not having any light fixtures on the second story. Um, and we've set forth in detail in our supplemental comments as well as our original comments filed last June, what we'd request on that front. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have other commenters, public commenters? Mr. Turner? At the moment, I do not have any more comment cards, and there are no hands raised online. OK, thank you. I'm now going to close public comment and bring it back to the commission for comments, questions, and ultimately a motion. Uh, who would like to start us off?
uh, Commissioner Riggs. Yes, thank you. Um, through the chair, if I could ask a couple of questions of staff. Please. Um, the first would be, um, is there uh, a guideline as to the location of the required tree to be planted in the front yard, the one that replaces the street tree? And by location, I mean something more specific than just in the front yard. For example, do, since it replaces a street tree, do we locate it close to the sidewalk? Through the chair, if I may answer Commissioner Riggs' question in regards to guidelines for location of planting a replacement tree, uh, for the replacement of the street tree, there um, are no specific guidelines um, to follow. Uh, however, as mentioned by Commissioner Riggs, it is something that we do uh, or would like the applicants to consider to plant the tree uh, as close uh, as possible towards the sidewalk, but within their property limits. All right, thank you. And then I just wanted to confirm uh, what guidelines we give a residential project regarding the heat pump. Um, as I recall, uh, in the past, we've had a guideline for nighttime and daytime uh, noise as measured at the property line. Is that still the only guideline that we have in the city? That is correct. That is the only guideline that we have that we do provide to applicants and residents when they do ask us for a particular location for their heat pumps. Unfortunately, we do not have any setback requirements. Uh, we base it upon the noise emitted from these uh, units. And through the chair, if I could add to that, so that um, is actually not a guideline. It's a code requirement. Um, so the closer the, the unit is to a residential property line, the quieter it needs to be to not exceed those limitations. Right, um, I recall that, thank you. Um, and then finally, um, and this amounts to a confession that I um, did not look at the lighting plan uh, on reviewing the drawings. Is there any balcony deck lighting? Uh, and Perhaps this is a more appropriate uh, question for the applicant. Excuse me, I, I may add a few. I saw here, so for the for the first floor uh, wall lighting, uh, we proposed the uh, uh, motion sensor with a downwards light. So it's, there was no light were facing towards the neighbor, it downwards. Is there any second floor exterior lighting? Uh, only at the back only. Uh, back only, uh, which I, I, I think is uh, required by the code for the safety issue matter. No other light on the second floor, only on the back okay, only. So that is what I call a Portola Valley can. Uh, it's a down light. Yeah. Yeah, down, downwards. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, no other questions, thank you. Who else has a question or a comment or ultimately a motion? Commissioner Schindler. Uh, thank you, Acting Chair Harris. Um, I, in reviewing all of this, all of the proposal um, and the details, um, noted that we are reviewing this because of the um, the fact that this is a, uh, it's simply a question of size of lot, uh, substandard as it relates to width. Um, but the um, proposal here meets um, you know, the zoning requirements. Um, I think, and so for, for those reasons, I am supportive. Um, I think what I would note is I went through and, and took a look at the various more subjective elements of the proposal. Um, I, I noted the staff report comment um, that transitional modern architectural style is not currently found within the neighborhood. 
um, and, and saw that as well. Um, while it is not a, a preference um, of mine, um, I find that not necessarily to be relevant. Um, what I would love to see simply from a visual preference perspective is that the water heater closet, um, which is at the very front of the parking space, um, but doesn't have any landscaping in front of it, um, be considered just for a visual alternative. I don't have a good suggestion. It just strikes me as I looked at the, the front facade of the house um, that it looked unbalanced and it called attention to it rather relative to the front, the front door um, and the designated parking garage. Um, so that is simply a, a piece of subjective feedback and not contingent for approvals. Thank you. Well, uh, while you all are contemplating, I have a question for the applicant. We've talked a little bit about the heat pump, uh, the noise, the nighttime, daytime noise, and we heard from a couple of the neighbors about um, the ability to get a heat pump that uh, is less noisy um, and that there are some other mitigation methods. I wonder if the applicant, if you could talk to us a little bit about your plan for the heat pump for this, um, for this application. We will uh, pick a model of the AC unit, which is uh, uh, per the CT code by the DB noise level. And also we open to maybe have an option to uh, create an enclosure for that unit. Uh, either it's on the unit itself, the sunproofing, or just the enclosure to further more reduce the noise from the unit. That's what we currently propose. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, at this point, does anybody else have any other comments or would you like to make a motion? Uh, oh, Commissioner Riggs, sorry, it's a little hard to see you guys. Yeah, sorry, I have no idea how it comes across at your end. Um, so, uh, I would like to make a motion. Um, um, as uh, Commissioner Schindler noted, we have um, probably limited, um, or at least what is appropriate in our comment is somewhat limited <clears throat> um, in architectural review terms. Um, but I do and has all, have always felt that we have some responsibility here, even if our responsibility is only applicable to half of the projects that come to community development. <clears throat> um, I also am, well, in this case, I'm not a particular fan of this um, version of um, transitional modern, um, but I do think that it is not my role to choose the design, uh, even though I feel it's appropriate to, um, to respond that this is probably not a visual addition to the neighborhood. Um, so having said that, I want to move on. And I would like to um, make a motion to approve with um, three conditions. Um, the first condition would be um, regarding the second floor windows as discussed with uh, neighbor, Mr. Webb, um, that if I understand it, the applicant is amenable to um, adjusting the lower half of the windows. And I believe it was uh, bathroom windows. Um, and I'll, I'll ask for that to be confirmed in a moment. <clears throat> um, then uh, I do think if the city expects the new tree, the street 
tree replacement or alternative to be planted as close to the sidewalk as possible, I think we need to say that. The typical setback, for example, in the Lorelei neighborhood is the tree is five feet from back of walk. Um, that seems to have worked out and ultimately provides a canopy tree, so I would like to suggest that. Um, and then um, I would like to express appreciation uh, that the designer has indicated um, an openness to uh, some kind of shielding of the heat point pump and uh, selecting a better unit. <clears throat> so what I would like to do is, uh, as, as this third condition, um, ask that the <clears throat> applicant work with the planning division to provide some measure of uh, enclosure to reduce the noise below 50 decibels at the property line. And I don't want to be more prescriptive than that. Um, so that would be my emotion to uh, approve the use permit with those three conditions. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Uh, I guess I would like to ask um, the applicant if those three um, items, if you would be amenable, I think you are, but if you could state whether or not you would be amenable to those three additions. And then I would also then ask staff if you uh, were able to take those down, uh, write them down uh, yes. and understand them. Yes, we're, we're okay with those three conditions. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I really appreciate um, your willingness to compromise um, in this situation. Um, okay, and then from staff, do you feel that you have what you need in order um, to perhaps maybe read back the motion so we make sure that we get it correct? Absolutely, so um, I do understand that there are three conditions of approval. The first one being the second floor windows uh, of the bathroom, the lower half of those windows should be made opaque. Number two, to plant the street tree as close to the sidewalk as possible. Number three, uh, work with the planning uh, department to provide an enclosure to reduce the noise emission from the selected heat pump to below 50 decibels. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have a second for this motion at this time. Okay. Um, Commissioner Schindler, thank you for that second. Okay, so let's, um, if there are no, are there any other comments? Otherwise, I think we can take a vote. Okay. Um, so through the chair, I'm sorry, I have, I do have a question. So the, the daytime and nighttime, the noise from the heat pump would need to be below 50 decibels. Is that correct? Is that, or is that part of the motion? through the chair um, yes I had <clears throat> I had specifically been concerned about nighttime noise but I, I have to say if the heat pump is going to be limited to noise I don't see how it would be otherwise than always below 50 it just seems like the natural um, result um, I I agree with Commissioner Riggs, especially if we're staying consistent and we just had a conversation. This was in front of us in our last meeting. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, through the chair, I just wanted to clarify because that's more strict than the municipal code. And then the second part, it doesn't need to be in an enclosure, it just needs to meet, be below 50 decibels. Is that correct? So we can give the applicant a little more flexibility through the chair. Um, no, the, uh -uh. the point was to endeavor to make a reduction. It's just that I didn't want to be prescriptive as to how much of a reduction. 
and I would like to leave that up to uh, to staff. Um, just as an example, it could be possible to build a low three-sided wall around the um, unit um, and no roof, and it that might be a um, effective way to say reduce the noise by three or four decibels. In other words, I don't want to prescribe a true enclosure that put potentially could uh, reduce it by 8, 10, or 12 decibels. That, that's n not the idea. It's to, to make a reasonable effort. OK. Um, let's see. I think maybe we have some concerns that this is not directly related to the proposed two-story house. Um, I believe we have a representative from the city attorney's office online. Um, I don't know if she's able to weigh in on this. Oh, sorry. It uh, looks like my camera was turned off, so I cannot start my, my camera. But that's OK. I don't well, need to. Um, yes, through the chair. Um, so this would be, uh, it looks like within the, oh, sorry, now my camera's on. Um, so it looks like that this would be um, within the scope of the two-story structure um, and within the scope of the Planning Commission's ability to condition that structure. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, I would like to allow the applicant, uh, who I think had another comment, to speak at this time. Yeah, I'm so sorry, uh, interruption. I, well, I just talked to the Greg. A little uh, clarif clarification. The two windows, condition number one, the two windows in the master bedroom, uh, it's not in the bathroom. Just clarify this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I want to ensure that we have this heat um, pump clarified for this motion. Um, so can you again, um, let's see, somebody from staff, if you could again clarify um, the, the motion, of the part about the heat pump as you see it. I just want to make sure we get it right before we all vote on it. I want it to be clear to the applicant. Okay, so um, as I heard the city attorney, it seems that it's okay to be prescriptive in terms of the number of units uh, or decibel units here. So my understanding of that condition is that the applicant will work with the planning division to provide an enclosure to reduce the noise of the heat bump heat pump to uh, below 50 decibel units. Okay, is that, um, Commissioner Riggs, is that what, what you're, is that fine with you? Is that what you were expecting? Uh, if it includes the words via uh, a sound reducing enclosure, yes. Uh, if it's not going to include those words, then I'll have to be prescriptive about what the result will be. My endeavor here, and perhaps it's not the smartest thing in the world, but it's um, you know a response at the moment here from the DS, is to frankly see if an enclosure <clears throat> cannot be um, reasonably provided that that makes a difference, and admittedly with some assumption that an enclosure will make a difference. Um, but um, I, I hesitate, unless staff is uncomfortable with that guideline, um, I hesitate to be more prescriptive. So through the chair, is, um, um, is staff comfortable with 
um, the request that there be a sound reducing enclosure without it being more prescriptive than that? Staff is comfortable with that. Thank you. Uh, but if I could uh, ask a clarifying question, would uh, we still be mentioning the reduction to below 50 decibel units, or would we just be uh, saying sound reducing enclosure? Yes, the, the purpose of the enclosure should be stated, and that is to reduce the sound below 50. Below 50 at the property line, in other words, the code. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, through the chair, I just wanted to also clarify there could be some um, limitations depending on what enclosure is chosen because of setbacks. Um, that is understood. I'll, I'll leave it up to staff to determine whether it's an architectural projection or um, it qualifies as a uh, fence below six feet. For example, uh, as I recall, you can build a storage shed that is below six feet without a permit and without requirements on location. So I'm hoping there's flexibility within that context. Okay. Um, does that does that work, Miss Sandmeyer? Um, yes, I believe that's clear. Thank you. Okay. So we have a first on the table, and we've got a second on the table. I think I would like to have us go ahead and vote at this point. Uh, Commissioner Doe. Thank you. Do you have a comment? I do. I actually have a question. I apologize. I actually wanted to um, clarify with the, the maker of the motion. Um, I believe, I don't know if it was actually you or another, um, or staff said the lower half of the window would be opaque. Um, and I just want to, um, I don't want to get too much, you know, too prescriptive to the applicant, but I just want to be um, fair. I feel like in the past we've made the stipulation that glass be obscure and I just wanted to clarify that I just didn't want to um, apply a different standard in this case when in the past maybe we've said obscure frosted but not necessarily opaque so I just wanted to make sure I, we, I, I understand clearly um, just that we can I don't know if my question to Commissioner Riggs. Thanks. Yeah thank you Commissioner Doe I would agree with that Commissioner Riggs. I agree. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, staff, so let's change the word opaque to obscured. Noted. Okay. And is that okay with the seconder as well, Commissioner Chandler? Yes, I'm fine with changing um, opaque to obscure. Um, okay. When, when we get to the, the when, we, when we close on that particular bullet, um, I would like to go back and revisit my understanding of the condition of the heat pump and the noise. Um, okay. So, but I want to close off on Commissioner Doe's feedback as well. Um, I would also, if through the chair, like to ask um, member of the public to address. If, if I may, uh, Woman, um, just a quick point of clarification on the uh, bullet about the um, second story windows. Those are on the plan documents. Um, those are actually the the windows on the master bedroom on the right elevation, second floor of the plan, not the bathroom. I just wanted to make sure that was clear in the record. And and thank you very much. Okay, thank you. The the applicant actually had already um, uh, explained that to us. Okay, so um, did you, uh, Commissioner Schindler, have any other comments about the heat pump or anything else before we vote? I, I do. Um, and so I think I am uncomfortable creating a new standard on a case by case basis um, for the noise ordinance for the city. Um, so what I would like to have that specific language say, um, and apologies, this was my understanding of, of the language when I offered the second, um, was that we were asking the applicant to strongly endeavor to, re to try a range of tactics, which could include um, a variety of the, an enclosure, um, but I did not hear a specific tactic prescribed. 
Um, so endeavor to reduce the noise levels to get it within as low as possible with under 50 decibels at night. But that is the statement, the important part of that statement is endeavor to. Um, I don't know that we are in a position to require a standard unique to this particular application that has not been applied elsewhere. Um, thank you, Commissioner Schindler. Can I request that the camera be put back onto the commissioners? I, I can't see the dais. Thank you. Okay, um, Commissioner Riggs, um, can you please respond to Commissioner Schindler's um, concern? Yes, of course, a very reasonable question. Um, the reason that I um, specifically mentioned an enclosure was, um, unless I misunderstood, um, the applicant had noted that they were open to looking at an enclosure. And I think this has um, the potential to be helpful to this commission and to the city um, if this offer of an effort at an enclosure bears fruit, it will not only be a kindness to the neighbor on Woodland, it might also be an additional tool um, city council to consider in the future as they have been hesitant to deal with um, a subject that they very reasonably feel they are not uh, expert in. So I am admittedly um, responding to uh, the applicant's comment. I am then omitting a specific goal in the same spirit as Ms. Schindler indicates, in that it's the effort that I think in this case is something we can ask for um, more easily than to expect a performance criteria. So thank you, Commissioner Riggs. So would you be comfortable with the language of endeavor that was proposed by Commissioner Schindler? Uh, if we were not targeting an enclosure, I would, but since we've se selected an enclosure, then there wouldn't really be an effort unless uh, an enclosure were attempted. But it amounts to the same thing since we're not specifying an outcome. I should say, in my opinion. Um, Commissioner Tate, you would you like to help us along a little? Um, yes, because I think I must have misunderstood completely um, what Commissioner Riggs was saying, because uh, from what I understood was below 50 decimals in the day and at night, right? Okay. And um, the city attorney said that was within our purview. So now it seems like we're backing it back up to 50 decimals. No, it was still below 50. Okay. Okay. So I think I have lost track of exactly what our wording says. So if somebody from staff could please read it back and then we have to determine whether this is something that we can all uh, or a majority of us can feel comfortable uh, stipulating. Uh, so staff has it down as the applicant would work with the planning department to provide a sound reducing enclosure to reduce the noise to below 50 decibel units during the day and night at the property line. Okay, um, Commissioner Schindler, are you, would you like to maintain your second or did you want to pull it based on the wording? Uh, through the chair, I would just like to ask a clarifying question to be sure that I completely understand the um, the, the condition as it's as it's been proposed, um, which I think is the spirit of what's been discussed. Please, uh, would if if that condition um, I'm trying to figure out the, the most productive way to ask it, if an enclosure were built and the nighttime 
decibels were not below 50, would it would the applicant have met the condition? Through the chair, if staff uh, may answer Commissioner Schindler's question. So you're saying there's the heat pump with uh, within an enclosure and during the night, it is not meeting the 50 decibel during the nighttime at the nearest property line, then the condition uh, wouldn't be considered to have been met. Okay. And thank you, appreciate that. Um, and then similar question, daytime. So if it were within built enclosure at, um, no, so that's it. Because the, guide, because the daytime guideline is 60, right? If it can meet the 60, the 50 at night, it would meet by definition, meet the daytime consideration. So if it doesn't meet, so if it's at 55 um, at night, does that meet the condition? Through the chair. Through the chair, um, this would not meet the municipal code uh, section for the noise ordinance where it mentions 60 decibels during the day and 50 during the night. So 55 decibels during the night with an enclosure would not be meeting the condition. Thank you, that's, that's, that's absolutely correct. I've turned myself, turn, sort of turned myself around trying to find the instance, just make, trying to make sure that I understand what the condition is actually really holding the applicant to. Um, and where that varies from other standards. So in this case, I believe it is if the daytime noise is, no, somebody else help me out here. If at any time the uh, noise from the unit uh, is 50 decibels or higher, it would not be in conformance. Right, 55. So for example, 55 during the day, would we consider the applicant to have met the condition? Through the chair, if I may answer. Um, I do not believe that it would meet the uh, condition once again, uh, per my understanding of the wording of the condition of approval, uh, it was mentioned that during the day and night that the unit be below 50 decibel units at the nearest property line. Thank, thank you for clarifying and bearing with me when I got my numbers and my day and my night straightened out. Um, I, I would like to withdraw my second at this point for that particular wording. I will okay, say. Commis Commissioner Doe. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut off Commissioner Tate's second. Um, with all due respect to Commissioner Riggs and Tate, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with the language of below 50 decibels at night. And I feel like Commissioner Riggs suggested that if that condition were met, it would also be below 50 during the day. Um, but I'm not com comfortable with the language of also during the day because um, that's, that's um, I thought that was what Commissioner might be saying, that that's not what the current zoning requirement is. Um, and I, I'm just not comfortable with that um, during the day. Yeah, through the chair, just to clarify, the, the requirement that it be below 50 decibels at night is also stricter than the municipal code. Because that says there the limit is just 50, not under 50. Actually, thank you for making that clarification. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm not comfortable. Also, I think Commissioner Schindler was saying this, making it stricter than what the, um, the, the code requires. Okay, I think what we're learning here is that maybe we aren't comfortable with the, what the code is um, because this is, keeps coming up um, and we're kind of trying to solve it um, here from the dais and it's getting, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to reach consensus. I see that planning manager, Kyle Parada has just come on and maybe he's gonna help solve our problem. Uh, thank you, uh, acting or interim chair Harris, if I, if I may. Um, I appreciate the commission's dialogue this evening, or we as staff, excuse me, appreciate the commission's dialogue this evening regarding the noise ordinance. I, I did wanna take this opportunity to chime in and clarify a few things. I think, um, uh, Ms. Kahn and Ms. Sandmeyer have 
done a good job of so far, but just one further clarification where I think Chair Harris, you were going, is this really is a broader policy issue. So, so while our, our um, assistant city attorney uh, did provide some legal guidance um, regarding how it may or may not apply to this use permit before the commission, uh, from a planning staff perspective, it would be important to have this dialogue through a broader policy discussion regarding noise, noise ordinance thresholds, uh, for mechanical equipment, be that air conditioning units versus heat pumps versus any other, um, you know, residential noise generating uses. I think um, there there are broader policy implications here that that would be best discussed, um, you know, through a different forum and and not through this specific use permit. So I think um, compliance with the noise ordinance is is a is a uh, threshold that planners look at. Uh, through building permits, ensure compliance with the daytime and nighttime. Um, and so, so that that's where we would recommend um, that the commission lands on this topic specifically with regard to this uh, use permit request this evening. Thank you for that. Oh, uh, Commissioner Tate. Okay, so um, to staff through the chair, I guess I'm, I'm a little confused then on how this is different than um, what was before us the last time we met. And on the dais, we agreed, um, and with the help of the folks in the community, that um, 50 decibels at the property line was too much. And that, yes, it was a, a commercial um, building, but it's dropped down uh, in a residential area. So how would that be different than dealing with another residence, again, still in a residential area? So I, I just, I guess I don't understand um, um, how we're not being consistent. And, and I get that it's an ordinance thing, but I also understand uh, Commissioner Riggs' point earlier about, um, you know, maybe this is a time where we can uh, um, help uh, city council or shine light on an issue for uh, city council to maybe take a look at this. So, and the city attorney said it is within our purview. So I, I guess I, it's just not clear to me. Thank you. Uh, if, if I may, uh, so the, the previous request for the Menlo Park community uh, campus was to exceed the nighttime noise ordinance. So so that application put forward for those heat pumps to operate the uh, the city's pool at the MPCC uh, would have been above 50 decibels during the nighttime hours. Uh, so that's between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. Um, I believe it was 55 decibels roughly approximately at the property line with those residential properties. And so that was a request for a use permit to exceed the noise ordinance specifically. That that is a different application, a different review. The commission, um, you know, provided us guidance to bring back a uh, findings for denial for that, which would revert back to the noise ordinance thresholds of 50 decibels during the nighttime hours and 60 decibels during the daytime hours, um, as with standard for any other mechanical equipment uh, at the nearest residential property line. So so that is a different request. Whereas this is a request for a two-story home um, on a substandard lot, and the heat pump is part of the the building's facilities um, to to meet the electrification um, goals of the city's climate action plan and requirements. So they are different applications, um, and so we'd recommend treating them differently. Right, but our recommendation um, was below fifty, so it. So our recommendation uh, last time when we asked for it to come back to us was below what the ordinance says. Is that, is, I was at the right meeting, right? Oh, okay. So, so yes, it was presented to us differently, but it's still the same issue. Yeah, through the chair, if I could um, respond to Commissioner Tate's question. So the, the MPCC heat pumps um, at the MPCC pool. So I believe that the commission's direction was for staff to come back with denial findings. And because the use permit was only to exceed the noise limitations, 
a denial would just mean that the facility needs to meet the noise limitations in the municipal code. And so um, the commission wouldn't be able to lower the limitations because that the whole use permit, the denial just means that they need to meet the municipal code. Um, so in this case, with um, the condition to go below the that threshold in the municipal code, then they would be um, at a lower threshold than the MPCC heat pumps. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Commissioner Riggs, you were the maker last week. Is that um, your takeaway from, from the motion that you made? Uh, through the chair. Um, Please. It's my understanding that the commission's action two, year, two weeks ago was in response to the community in what was a well-expressed and valid concern with what amounted to uh, a message both to the community and to council that the community pool needed to meet a better standard. <clears throat> um, so this project is, I think, clearly different. This is a case of, um, in a way, somewhat similar to the variance that we granted for um, uh, a daylight plane because the applicant wanted to be more considerate of the neighbor and move their second story and bias it to the street side. Um, there was no apparent other advantage to the applicant other than to be considerate to the neighbor. Um, I see something similar here in that the applicant is saying certainly not asking for a variance um, but the applicant is indicating a willingness to attempt an enclosure to be a better neighbor i have to say in my neighborhood there is no way i would put in a heat pump without an enclosure we all open our windows at night in any weather but the coldest or windiest um, so uh, I, I back that, um, and I would like our commission to respond to that willingness by making it part of the conditions so that we can actually see, see it happen. Um, otherwise, um, economics being what they are, such an offer could simply be withdrawn. Um, so um, I realize this doesn't respond to the um, hesitation, but I can't help but pointing out that the challenge to the 50 decibel limit is at least 20 years old in Menlo Park. Um, I quite remember uh, the people who uh, came to this council chamber in about 99 or 2000 and said, please do you realize what 50 decibels is at night? I mean, the conversations in this council chamber are tending to be around 50 decibels. If you were in your bedroom at one o'clock in the morning, at the very least, I think you'd get up and close the window. Um, so it's, um, um, and by the way, there's some debate. I've also uh, heard it likened to louder um, images that we have. So perhaps we're stretching a little bit here, but we're doing so on, um, I think, agreeable ground. Um, so if we're willing to try that, I would like to um, keep, the motion in place, um, but I am prepared to amend the motion if this doesn't work. Uh, Commissioner Riggs, if I may, given that this 
as you say, is that the applicant is will has a willingness to to, a, to attempt an enclosure to be a better neighbor, but it is not exactly the code. I wonder if we could use the word endeavor um, and realize that there's a small risk that the applicant could change their mind, um, but that we have asked that they do endeavor to create um, an enclosure to reduce the decibels. Oh boy. And now I see that the, we, we have another entrant here, the city attorney's office. Could you uh, please go ahead? Uh, yes, Chair Harris. Um, I was just going to echo your point, actually. Um, I, I, the fact that the applicant is willing to participate in this condition is a big part of why it's, you know, makes sense for it to be included. Um, but the word endeavor would indeed strengthen the condition from a legal perspective as well, considering that <clears throat> um, we would be asking for not just meeting the code standard, but reducing it below the standard. Thank you for that. Um, and at the same time, I would hope that that members of the city council are listening, or if they're not, they will be hearing about this so that we can consider uh, rethinking some of this. But in, at any rate, Commissioner Riggs, um, given that discussion, would you be willing to change um, and you and add the word endeavor to into your motion on the third um, the third stipulation? Yes, I would be. In fact, um, I think uh, Commissioner Schindler uh, phrased it well, and I would accept that phrasing. Thank you. Um, Ms. Khan, do you have that phrasing from Ms. Schindler, or would you like her to attempt to reenact her phrasing? Thank you, Chair uh, Harris. I would appreciate uh, Commissioner Schindler repeating the condition for me. All right, I'll give it a shot. Um, endeavor to reduce noise levels via a range of tactics, such as building an enclosure. I'm not sure that's exactly it, but uh, Commissioner Riggs, would you be okay with that language? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, with that, Commissioner Schindler, would you like to uh, bring back your second? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to put my second uh, back out there with all three of the stipulations um, that we've discussed. The, the obscure um, master bedroom, second floor windows for part of them, the tree placement as close as possible to the sidewalk and the language that we just discussed as it relates to the effort to reduce noise from the heat pump. Okay, thank you. Now, if there are no other comments, I would like to take a vote on this motion. Okay, Commissioner Doe. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Schindler. Yes. Commissioner Tate. No. Okay, and I am a yes. So um, again, I think we the motion passes with four uh, commissioners as yeses, one commissioner as a no, and one commissioner absent. Um, I, I, I think we we have made a compromise, and yet I think we're not entirely satisfied, and this is going to keep coming back until we all feel more comfortable about the direction of where this is going and it is gonna keep coming back up. All right, thank you very much to my fellow commissioners. Uh, and that ends this uh, F1. And now we're gonna move on to F2, which is a use permit and architectural control for modifications to Sharon Heights Golf and Country Club at 2900 Sand Hill Road. And I will read that description. F2, use permit and architectural control for Sharon Heights Golf and Country Club on 
2900 Sand Hill Road, consider and adopt a resolution to approve a use permit and architectural control to make landscaping modifications to an existing golf course in the OSC, that's Open Space and Conservation Zoning District. The proposed work includes grading changes, irrigation improvements, new pathways, and landscaping throughout the fairways. The proposal also includes an expansion of the artificial lake for additional recycled water storage. The project also includes a request to construct three carports on the main parking lot adjacent to the existing clubhouse and two pergolas, pergolas adjacent to the existing clubhouse and pool deck, which would provide solar arrays. Determine this action is categorically exempt under CEQA guidelines, section 15301's class one exemption for existing facilities, section 15302's class two exemption for replacement or reconstruction, section 15303's class three exemption for new construction or conversion of small structures, and section 15311's class 11 exemption for accessory structures. The city arborist conditionally approved the removal of 258 heritage trees for the proposed project. Is there a presentation from staff um, or the applicant for this F2? Good evening and thank you, Acting Chair Harris, Planning Commissioners and members of the public. I'll go ahead and start. Um, Matt Pruder, Associate Planner, planning division as an update for this project staff has received six comment letters following the publication of the staff report and these comments have been forwarded to the planning commission these comments are also being included within the agenda and uh, of the six comments uh, they've included some expressing support for the project as well as comments expressing concern with the number of tree removals the process of the tree removal review and the level of environmental review in addition, the project applicant team is available for a presentation that they have prepared. And there are also some team members, uh, both in the council chambers and available virtually for any questions. The uh, members in the council chambers would like to present following my remarks, uh, but I am uh, available for any updates and uh, any questions that you have. I'm sorry, I'm available for any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Okay. So if somebody could mute themselves, but there's a lot of noise. Okay, seems like that's over now. Yes, I would like um, if we could have the um, applicant um, provide us a short presentation and then after that we'll see if there are any clarifying questions from or comments from the commissioners. Thank you, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Andy Duncan. I'm a longtime resident of Menlo Park, a 26-year member and past president of Sharon Heights Golf and Country Club. And I have the pleasure of representing Sharon Heights Golf and Country Club tonight to discuss our current club renovation and improvement projects. It's been a pleasure working with staff on this project, and especially Matt Pruder and Jillian Keller, who have been quite helpful. We are also, um, also in attendance today, either in person or virtually, are several experts who we are working with on the project who will be happy to answer any questions. Frank Petrelli, our attorney, Cliff Bechtel, our civil engineer, Gordon Mann, our arborist, Scott Yarger, our environmental specialist, Chad Twaddle, our golf course superintendent. I also have my colleagues in our golf course renovation committee in attendance, Steve Smith, and Kurt Wozniak, who can also answer any questions. Thank you, Matt, for the overview of the project. And I'd like to spend a few minutes walking you through a short slide presentation about the history of our club and our continued sustainability efforts. You go ahead and move the slide, please. So in 2018, we embarked on a master planning process to improve the infrastructure at the Golf and Country Club with a focus on sustainability. The first project that we did was a recycled water facility that I'm sure many of you know about that was completed in 2020. We're here today to seek your approval for the following, which is a solar energy system for our clubhouse and a renovation of our golf course. Next slide, please. 
So a little overview of the uh, recycled water plant. Uh, we're in a public-private partnership with West Bay Sanitary District. The uh, plant went live with state approval in July of 2020. It's a 99-year partnership that's financed by Sharon Heights Golf and Country Club and operated by West Bay Sanitary District. The goal was to meet the needs of our golf course with regard to water. And today, we're really proud to be able to say that uh, the targeted delivery of this water plant is 400,000 gallons a day with a maximum of 500,000 gallons, which means we are actually putting 180 million gallons a year uh, of water back into the Hetch Hetchy system. It's a significant project. We're very proud of it. Next slide. There's an aerial photo you can see in the green area up there where this is. So as you're coming off the off ramp onto uh, off Sand Hill onto 280 northbound, it's right there. Um, never had any noise complaints or anything like that. So everybody seems to be very happy with the location of the project. Next slide, please. So the solar project, there's two things we're talking about today. One is I wanted to give you an overview of the water, but the second thing is the solar project and then the golf course renovation. So the project uh, with regard to the solar is we are proposing um, building a 500 kilowatt system in our um, a parking lot and over our pool complex. I'm gonna show you a slide of what that looks like in a minute. Uh, the cost of this project is about a million six. We're gonna include battery storage to minimize the uh, grid usage. And uh, the panels again are gonna be installed in our parking lot and pool structure with a compliant wood trellis uh, that looks like the clubhouse so that it all blends in. Um, I wanna alert the commission that this is only the first of two more projects that we will be bringing forth to the planning commission. One is we intend to install a solar system at our recycled water plant. Uh, recycled water plant takes a lot of energy to run those pumps and we will be coming forth with a plan and hopefully we can go live with uh, this in some time in 2024. We also are gonna be coming forth with a plan to build a new operations center that you'll see and hear about in another two or three months. Uh, the state of California is requiring that we move all of our equipment to electric. So all the mowers and everything will be electric and we're gonna need to build a new operations center to be able to support the housing of that equipment and we intend to solar uh, energize that particular building so that again we're being sustainable with regard to uh, you know uh, uh, appropriately being able to charge our equipment utilizing the solar power next slide please if you go back one one second or one slide. Yeah, so the, the blue represented here will be where the, uh, where the panels will be. Um, you can see that not only is that there's three major uh, panels in the, um, uh, in the parking lot, but also in and around our pool complex. We wanted to put more panels, but unfortunately we have a PG&E line that runs through the parking lot and they were unwilling to allow us to build over those lines. So we're getting about 72% of the total energy needs that we need for the clubhouse through this system. We hope with improvements to the system and also the new solar that we'll put on the operations center and the new solar that we'll put at the water plant that we'll actually be able to get to our goal of 100% sustainability with regard to energy uh, for all of our club use. Next slide, please. So the golf course. So um, the, the focus on the golf course is that the golf course was built in the early 1960s. We are having a lot of trouble with regard to our irrigation system and with regard to drainage. Um, there is a real need for us to be able to, as part of our sustainability goals, redo the golf course to bring about certain values that will come from the work that we're gonna do in redoing the golf course. First of all, we're going to see a significant reduction in water usage. And even though we're using recycled water, we want to be able to put that back to use. And in fact, we've actually offered recycled water to the city for Sharon Park and, and fill the pond and use it for irrigation 
uh, at no cost. So we were trying to work with other people to actually buy some of the excess water that we have coming out of the recycled water plant. So water usage is still really important for us to be able to control on the golf course. We're going to be reducing turf grass. We also are going to be reforesting the land. And this is uh, one of the big issues that, that Matt brought up that we've had quite a bit of comment from um, you know, citizens about what are we really doing with regard to the, the trees. I'm going to get into a detailed overview of the trees in a second, but I want you to know that those the 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 plan is to plant 208 new native trees including 160 oaks so if you look at our logo it's an oak leaf it's been that way since 1961. we know menlo park is the tree city we're so excited about our ability to plant these new 160 oaks as part of this project we also are going to be installing new drought tolerant landscaping throughout the entire project. Um, as you can see, there's a, a picture here of, uh, you know, some native grasses that'll take a lot less water, a lot less maintenance, and actually will be beautiful. And then we also, uh, as part of this plan, we have a lake today. Uh, it's a man-made lake. Uh, it was originally approved when the golf course was built in the early 60s. Uh, use permits of 1.7 million gallons. We're going to be increasing that to 2 million gallons because that's where we store the recycled water. And we're not going to be expanding the size of the lake. We're going to go down by three or five feet and we're going to line the lake so that we can actually get more storage of this recycled water. And then the other thing that we're doing is we're installing a new irrigation and drainage system. The irrigation systems are very technical now. We can get to the point literally off of running it off of an iPhone to be able to water one sprinkler head, one area, as opposed to having a complete circuit going with 20 sprinkler heads going just to try and get one dry area. So this is something that we need to do. Our irrigation system is over 30 years old. It's breaking all the time. We've got to do this work in order to maintain uh, the golf course. Next slide, please. So this is an aerial photo of 1965 of the, um, uh, of the golf course. What's interesting to point out here is that this native piece of land does not have any redwood trees on it. Um, this is, these are all oak trees that you see. And so it's, it's really fascinating to you know, take a look at what happened and how did we end up with 1,300 of these redwood trees. Next slide, please. So in 1962, the members planted 1,000 plus of five gallon redwood trees to address, address the safety issues on uh, our golf course layout. And what's happened is that the land there is very heavy with regard to clay soil. There's a lack of fog and water, which is the redwood trees need this. And we're actually seeing that these trees were planted way too closely together. So now 60 years later, we're starting to see a lot of these trees fail. And the trees are just too dense to support long-term growth and sustainability of all the trees. The extended drought has created a lot of stress on these trees, and many of the trees are dead and failing. We not only had our arborist, um, but we also worked with the city arborist in detail, um, managing every single tree, understanding the health of every single tree, and trying to identify what was the right thing to do with regard to not only the health and sustainability of the existing trees, but also not improving the golf course and what type of trees we should plant in replacement of those trees that we intend to take out. So we currently have 1,300 total trees on the golf course, give or take one or two. Uh, 359 are being removed, 342 are heritage size, and 91 of the 342 have been deemed in poor health or debt. Uh, we've gone through the, the permitting process, as you know, for uh, both of those trees, um, uh, or uh, two, two different permitting processes, one for the uh, poor health and dead trees and one for the heritage trees. The 208 new trees that are being planted, 160 oaks, 43 sycamores, five cypresses, 
and they're going to vary in size from 36 inch boxes to 72 inch boxes and they'll be an average of 20 to 25 feet, feet tall. Some will be larger, some will be a little bit smaller, but our intent is we want to plant as mature a tree as we can to be able to beautify uh, the golf course. Next slide, please. So over the past year, as we've been contemplating, well, actually a couple of years that we've been con contemplating this, this project, on October 23rd and October 29th, we uh, held two different community meetings. We've worked very hard, everybody, to reach out to the community to make sure that the community not only understood why we're doing this, but the importance of doing this. Um, at those meetings, we had over 100 people attend. We reviewed the plans. Uh, we explained the timing. Each meeting went several hours. We literally got into detail with people about trees by their property and what was going to happen to their particular tree or, or those that they, uh, you know, that was close to their property. We've also had follow-up meetings with board members of the HOAs within the community. There's three different HOAs that are within the community. And everyone that has asked for a meeting, we've met with, we've done a site walk, we've talked with them, um, and we, we've really tried to follow up and address any concerns. We also have in your packet letters of support from the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter, uh, from the Audubon International, and also from Stanford University. Part of the golf course that we have, we have some land that we lease from Stanford University. Uh, all three of those entities are in full support uh, of the project. I think it's also important to point out that we have 153 households that are members of Sharon Heights. That's over 350 people. You see the audience that we have here today behind me that have come in support of this project. Um, these are people that live in Menlo Park, love Menlo Park, and Sharon Heights is a very important part of the community, as you know. Next slide. So um, one of the big issues that I wanted to bring up um, and not wait for questions has to do with the fact that while we own the land um, that's underneath the road that is what's called Sharon Park Drive, there is an easement that we provided both to the homeowners association and the city, homeowners associations and the city to be able to ingress and egress out of their particular property. This particular area has been a bit of a concern because there's a lot of, uh, there's car traffic that comes in and aesthetically it's important to the homeowners to be able to, you know, have a nice entrance with these trees. Unfortunately, along that road, and I'm going to show you a picture of what it looks like, we've got a number of dead and dying trees. 20, 27 need to be removed, 23 are in poor uh, or dead condition and we really need to get them out of there before you know they fall in these storms or somebody gets hurt. Two of the trees are in fair and two are in good condition, but we're recommending that we remove those trees for the health of the other surrounding trees because they're encroaching on each other. So there will be 36 trees remaining in this particular area, and we have committed to the homeowners associations in meetings, you have letters in your packet, uh, a plan to replant appropriate trees and an appropriate number of trees along this road, not only to protect people that walk, but also to protect the cars that are there uh, so that we're, we're really, you know, being very um, um, aware of the need to make sure that the Homeowners Association is um, satisfied with the way in which uh, their entrance and exit um, uh, looks. Uh, so we're, you know, we're willing to do whatever they want and we're willing to work with them and the uh, representatives of each of the homeowners association to make sure that this is done appropriately. We also, which you could see if you dig into the plans, will be adding extensive landscaping in this area that is not there today that will further beautify it. Next slide. So this is a, um, a picture of the uh, road that comes in in between our second fairway and our eighth fairway. The, I'm sorry that this is kind of hard for people to see, but uh, the red trees, uh, the red marks are the uh, dead or dying. Uh, the yellow are fair and the green are good. So you see we're, we're taking out some of the trees, but certainly not all of them. And then the current tree planting plan 
prior to the agreement of the homeowners association is down below and we've got a couple of renderings that our arborists have suggested and we're working with the city arborist as well on the type of native tree that we would put back into this particular area next slide please so this is a, a picture of the street. Um, you'll see there where you can see the redwood trees um, uh, you know, uh, out in the distance. And this is an example of if we put uh, olive trees uh, as an example in between the redwood trees, um, uh, kind of how it would look. Uh, next slide is, an, is a better example, I think. Uh, and this is kind of what it would look from our, our eighth fairway uh, kind of looking northbound with the street on the right hand side. You'll see the remaining redwood trees after we've taken out the dead and dying ones and uh, replacing them with, uh, again, something like an olive tree or something else. We didn't render all of the new landscaping that will be along there, but it, it will be um, much more beautiful than it is today. Next slide, please. So um, with regard to the schedule, uh, we're very happy to be here. It's been a, uh, a heck of a long road to get here, uh, but staff has been great to work with. And um, the issue is that the contractors that do this kind of work, uh, they're very specialized. We have contracts that are signed, and the timing of when this work gets done is important. We're actually shutting the golf course down for a year. It takes six months to actually do the work to install the new irrigation system, install the new drainage. We're going to be putting in new turf. We're going to build new greens, new uh, bunkers, and new uh, um, uh, tee boxes. We're not changing the routing. We're not doing any material changes to the golf course. This is effectively infrastructure work that we're doing. But we have to do this work starting in April. If we wait and we get hung up by the rain, then we're really going to be in trouble. So it's imperative that we actually move forward with this and, and hopefully with your consent, get approval tonight to be able to allow us to start the project uh, starting on April 1. Um, there's six months of construction and then you basically uh, grow the grass in for another six months before you're actually able to play. Uh, so we're excited about the result. There's no actual hard construction. We're not putting up any buildings here. This is replacement of the infrastructure of the golf course itself. Uh, so with that, um, I will um, uh, yield back to uh, the Planning Commission. Thank you. I'll also be happy to, to bring up um, any of our experts if you have questions and or my, my colleagues, Steve and um, Kurt, to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for letting me present. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Um, before we go to public comment, I wanted to see if anyone from the commission had any clarifying questions for the applicant or staff. Um, Commissioner Schindler. Yes. I, uh a question for staff through the chair. Um, there was reference in the report about a portion of the 111 acres being leased. Um, thank you for clarifying from whom it was leased, Stanford University. Is there anything that the, 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 vari the variation between the land being owned or leased changes about the application itself? Thank you for your question. Um, we have dealt with leased projects before. Uh, a recent one that I've worked on was at the Phillips Brooks School, which is leased by the uh, school from the Las Lomitas School District. And it still had to undergo the same requirements uh, because it's in the city of Menlo Park. And in that case, it was a private development versus public schools, uh, different being a school, but the same concept being as a lessee, they were still required to undergo the same requirements. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I was hoping the answer was. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, now I would like to open up this item for public comment. As a reminder, please raise your virtual hand if you're on Zoom and for those in chambers, please bring a comment card up to Mr. Turner and any commenters will have, actually, let's see how many commenters 
can you, uh, Mr. Turner, can you tell me how many commenters um, or questioners we have? Yeah, so at the moment, uh, we have three online and one in person. Um, again, please, if you're in person and would like to give public comment, um, fill out a comment card and bring it up to me uh, for online. So they seem to be trickling in a little bit. So currently five. Okay. All right. Um, we will uh, keep the limit at three minutes for those commenters. Uh, please go ahead, Mr. Turner. Thank you. Um, and again, I will start with the online commenters uh, just to give those in person a chance to fill out a comment card. Um, so we will start with Lynn Bramlett. Lynn, you should be able to unmute yourself um, now. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, Lynn Bramlett. First, I know a number of people living in one of the HOAs, and it's a beautiful facility. Um, it would have been helpful to have the presentation attached to the agenda so we had time to look at it ahead of time. And I'm commenting specifically about the trees. Um, and also some high, I'm sorry, I'm in a, a Nevada right now and I'm in a <laughs> hotel with some dogs barking. So please just ignore that. Um, have the correspondence link too. So um, I have a few uh, concerns and suggestions. So the beginning of the staff report talked about 258 heritage trees uh, got the okay for removal. But when you read it, you realize, well, the applicant really wanted to remove uh, 366 and 89 non-heritage. 108 were dead or deceased. I get that. But that leaves, if I'm doing the math right, 150. And there was no explanation given why they didn't get the okay and I was curious that would be good to put it in the report and if if the beginning had more of an overview that was consistent with the numbering that would have been helpful and the gentleman who gave the presentation I, I couldn't really keep up with the various numbers of the trees so I'm you know maybe there's even been a change since he, he did also mention this is only the first of two more projects so there may be more coming with more trees so I am concerned about the trees. You know, they benefit all of Menlo Park. And it, to me, it's it's something for our whole city. And there also does seem to be a double standard with the tree removal. And I speak as a homeowner where my husband and I, we did get permission to remove one tree that was clearly diseased, but we didn't get permission for another, which is the very ugly tree. We are, We have a lot of trees in our front yard. So it just feels as though, and you hear it, it's extremely difficult for residents to have trees removed, but it just seems as though it's kind of green lighted for these big development projects. So I, I raise concern about uh, double standard and, um, you know, it kind of would be helpful to know how, how many have been removed given large development projects and, and so forth. So you know, in the future, I just make these suggestions. Thank And thank you for your good work, commissioners. I think you have a very difficult job. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Jennifer Johnson. Jennifer, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi, um, my name is Jennifer Johnson and I live in Sharon Heights. I live in an HOA that is within the golf course behind the gate on Sharon Park Drive. One thing I would like to um, point out to um, Andy is that he mentioned that the Sharon Park Homeowners Association was supportive of this plan, but there are actually two HOAs past the gate and ours, the Country Club Fairways Homeowners Association was not mentioned. Um, and we were not invited to a presentation given to the other HOA. I was not able to attend the outreach meetings as I was away due to a family emergency. I have concerns about the trees being removed. My understanding is that there are well over 400 trees being slotted for removal, 258 of which are heritage trees, yet only uh, 208 trees are being replaced. 
of those trees along that driveway, which protects our cars and our children and et cetera, um, the trees being put in are 20 to 25 feet tall, which is far, far shorter than the ones that are currently there now. And I'm curious as to how we are supposed to be protected with flying golf balls, of which we have had multiple, multiple incidents. I am further concerned that although Andy said there is no hard construction, no new buildings coming, they are going to be jackhammering and having heavy equipment there for over six months. So during the spring and summer, when we all want to enjoy the outside spaces, there is going to be removal of all of the hardscape there, all of the sand pits, all of the grass, which I assume is going to be with loud, heavy equipment that is also going to be spraying our entire community with fumes. Menlo Park seems to want to have a reduction in gasoline powered equipment so that we're not inhaling all these things. But again, I kind of echo the previous commenter of the double standard, this is going to be just allowed for the country club. So the air pollution and the noise, we're not going to be allowed able to open our windows for six months during this project. I would ask that weekday afternoons be quiet hours so that we could at least enjoy part of our outdoor space during that time. Hmm. There has also been no um, transparency about the specific trees adjacent and around our community, I'm at 1100 Sharon Park Drive, that are scheduled to be removed. We do not know the safety risks that are upon us because of that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Ron Schloss. Ron, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, hello. Um, thank, thank, uh, um, thank everybody who, uh, thank the Planning Commission. I've, I've never been to one of your meetings before, and what goes on here is very important and all very well thought out and discussed. So my kudos to the Planning Commission for that. Um, also, I, I guess I would start by saying I can't believe the task that the Sharon Heights Golf and Country Club uh, is going through in terms of the planning that that requires and every detail that you've had to look at. Uh, I don't know if this is a place for questions or just to, to, to make a statement. The first statement I'll make is that uh, Sharon Heights Country Club uh, um, incredibly has gone through an incredible process of getting this uh, to the floor today. And I very much respect and admire that. I too have the concern about trees. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if we're allowed to ask questions or if it's just a, a comment. Um, what my, One of my comments slash questions would be, there's been a lot of discussion about native trees versus the redwoods that are currently there. Um, my comment would be, to me, I see no value in replacing a redwood with a na native tree unless there's an environmental impact to that or maybe even a cost impact to the, to the country club. Uh, we've had those same discussions here on Sand Hill Circle, and uh, there, there is a, a, a somewhat I idea going on that native, native vegetation is great, but it's not a necessity as long as you're meeting environmental uh, environmental concerns. My second question or statement slash question is kind of referring back to the, the first comment. Um, I, can under, I, I can understand the removal of sick and unhealthy trees and maybe even the removal of trees that endanger other trees, but there seems to be a couple of hundred trees that are unaccounted for in terms of the reasoning of removing them. So I would make that statement or pose it as a question, what are the what is the basis behind removing trees that aren't endangering other trees or that aren't unhealthy? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Nancy LaRocca. 
Nancy Headley, um, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nancy LaRocca Headley. I am a member of the city's Environmental Quality Commission, but I'm speaking tonight as an individual. I was alerted to this issue last week when a member of the Sharon Heights community emailed the members of the EQC, and I echo the concerns raised by the other commenters. Um, in addition, I have some thoughts about the process. And so I'm thinking, ideally, when a large number of heritage trees are being considered for removal, we should have some type of citywide public conversation to really understand the impact that any proposed action would have so that the needs of everyone can be understood and ideally met. Um, I don't know if this forum is that place for the community conversation, but it could also potentially happen at an Environmental Quality Commission meeting, given that its charter includes the preservation of heritage trees and a mandate to help the city preserve and expand our urban canopy. And I'm thinking that this type of proactive approach that's citywide might work better than asking residents to learn the inner workings of city government's appeal process and, page and pay large fees to have a voice in the process. So thank you for hearing my words. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Rick Johnson. Rick, you should be able to, um, you disappeared. Rick, would you still like to give public comment? If so, okay, there we go. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Thank you. I have a, a brief uh, clarifying comment. The Audubon International is not um, affiliated with the National Audubon Society, which is a national conservation organization, or Sequoia Audubon Society, which is the local chapter. And I just wanted everybody to understand uh, the difference. Thanks a lot. Thank you. That looks to be our last um, online commenter. We do have um, an in-person commenter, Ron Snow, if you would like to speak. I have random notes. Um, I think what what uh, some of what is missing from here is just looking at this from a from a a little bit higher up level. This uh, environment that's in the country club actually uh, impacts the area for miles around. There's uh, birds, there's uh, hawks, there's, uh, there's a biodiversity that this thing uh, creates, has created, and it doesn't seem like there's much um, information on what's the impact. These um, animals, these insects, uh, these microbes, however low you want to go, all are um, living and um, ex um, they're living their lives and, and that affects the entire area. The entire area goes for miles. I mean, you could envision this going to Woodside Road and past Alpine Road in the sense that birds fly, insects fly. So I think that's one element that needs to be identified. It, does make, it doesn't make sense to me that um, when I was looking at the maps and things, when I was looking at all the trees that would be removed, of all those trees that were in red, uh, there were four trees that were identified as being ill or sick. So there's hundreds and hundreds of trees that were in red that were heritage trees that were be to, to be removed, and only four on that chart that were actually labeled as sick. So I, I have some suspicion that uh, if you look at the peninsula and what we've been going through from the drought, one could claim that every tree on the peninsula is suffering and every tree is in poorer health. And so we shouldn't just jump to uh, say that, well, okay, then all trees can be removed. And I think one of the other uh, people had mentioned that too. And since let's be more selective, let's set an example that uh, for preserving trees uh, that our children will be proud of and our grandchildren will be proud of. How much time do I have? Um, 
there was something said about the redwoods not being native. And if we go back to our grade school history class, we know that Portola came into the flatlands here and labeled the Palo Alto tree. That's a redwood tree. There were redwood trees back then. There were um, grizzly bears. There was lots of things there. So redwood trees are, are native trees to this area. And the fact that they've grown so well is just underlines the aspect that they are uh, an important tree for this area and should be considered native. I think it might make more sense for the golf course to change, they can do all this stuff without doing, removing a lot of this, a lot of these trees, most of these trees. They can put in the irrigation systems, they can put in the new turf, they can put in their buildings in the lake, uh, all without having to remove all those trees. They just need to be more in, uh, innovative about what they're gonna do to the fairways. So I wrote a, a statement that hopefully you guys will read uh, later. Thank you. That was my three minutes, right? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, our next speaker will be Joseph David Davis. Thank you, commissioners. I, I am a member at Sharon Heights, and I want to speak in favor of the project, uh, but not as an individual, not representing the club. Um, I started off this process not being involved in the golf course project at all and was against the idea of taking out trees. I am a tree lover, tree hugger, whatever you want to call it. And so I really questioned taking out as many redwoods, which I think are beautiful. But as I studied the project and look into it, what I realized, despite what people are saying here, to the terrain we have at the golf course, the redwood trees are not native. In fact, our founders of the club created a bit of an environmental disaster by going out and planting redwoods and tree. Yes, redwoods grow here, but near water sources where the Palo Alto tree, the gentleman talked about, it's right on the creek. Uh, they're in the foothills. But if you look at the native area around here, Stanford near the dish is what our native area looks like. It's big grass fields with oak trees there. We had that kind of land and to, and to line up the golf course, we planted all these trees, which now have grown to be 80, 100 feet tall. Redwood trees suck water out of the ground at a rate so much higher than oak trees. And so what you see is we're having to pour water in the ground to keep alive trees that really shouldn't have been there. We're not taking out, you know, we have 1,300 trees. We're taking out 200 and replacing the majority of those with oaks and sycamores, which are much more miserly in terms of water. And so to me, what we're trying to do is undo some bad decisions that were made before to put those in there. I would love not to take out a tree, but you can walk through the course and we have with the town arborist and see how many of these trees are just really in bad health because they're planted really close together. They're fighting each other for water. We're trying to spread those ones out that are there and leave the ones that aren't being damaged, that aren't unhealthy to do it. And so it really is an improvement to the environment to get more trees in there than we have today. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I do not have any other comment cards at this time. I don't see any more um, online commenters that have raised their hand um, since. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Turner. And thank you to all the commenters. It's, it's really helpful to us to hear from uh, folks in the public. Um, so I'd like to bring it back to the dais and open up um, for any of the commissioners who would like to start um, discussing this uh, project. And I know that we have a number of folks here who can answer questions both from staff and um, from the applicant. Uh, so who, who would like to start us off on this project? Okay, well, while some of you are um, thinking through what your questions and comments might be, um, based on some of the comments that we've gotten from the public, I'd just like to ask staff a couple of questions. Um, one is, um, if the EQC commission does have purview over trees, I'm wondering why this project did not go to the EQC or was there a plan for it to go to the EQC? That would be to staff. My apologies, thank you for your question, uh, Interim Chair Harris. 
the heritage tree removal permit component that it pertains to the development based removals would only be appealed to the EQC, the Environmental Quality Commission. If it's appealed, it would go to a meeting with the EQC. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Um, let's see, I might have had another. Oh, another questioner asked, would there be more trees eliminated in the second and third projects? Um, that will be coming to the commission later? I guess that would be a question to the applicant. So the answer is no. Okay, all right, thank you. Very succinct too, succinct. Okay, um, could I, now how about the commission? Are, are we ready to have any discussions? Who would like to? start us off with questions or discussions about this project. Commissioner Schindler. Thank you, Interim Chair Harris. Um, through the chair, I, I do have some questions um, so that I may better understand the, um, the longer term um, implications of, of some of the renovations that are being uh, that are being proposed here. Um, there's definitely a, a discussion in the presentation and in the staff report about the life cycle, um, the life cycle of trees that be, are you know, 60 to 70 years old um, and the golf course landscaping, irrigation, drainage and, and cart paths being you know, roughly 25 years old and, and out of date. Um, I would like a, a, an understanding of given today's technology in developing golf courses, um, what a future life cycle of a renovation like this looks like, right? How now that I'm assuming, and I'm assuming we are better at this than we were 25 years ago. Um, what the timeline for a successful long lasting course, including the irrigation and all of the other elements looks like. Thank you. So um, it's, it's a great question. Um, when you look at the new irrigation pipe that we're putting in, it has like a 50 year warranty. So we're really looking at this as a long term project. And we think that this renovation should last certainly 30 to 40 years. Um, that's, that's the answer. Thank you. That's cool. certainly longer than, than this, the, the sort of backward looking information that we have about the renovations that were done in, or the initial development that was done in the 60s. Right. Are there any other elements related to the drainage um, or any of the other elements of landscaping um, that are relevant in terms of timeline? Well, certainly the focus on the landscaping has been to, you know, be, um, you know, ad adhere to the new water standards and, and you know, making it um, uh, certainly less less water needy, uh, if you will. Uh, I also think that the comment earlier about the water with regard to the redwood trees and how much water they take is also, that was an, an extensive and important um, statement. One of the things that I'd like to talk about the trees for just a second is that we brought in experts in the world of urban forestry to look at this issue that we have with these trees. Uh, we worked extensively with the city arborist literally down to every tree to determine how many of them we could save and how many of them we could keep and the appropriate trees to plant as new trees. So this was done with a lot of thought. We're not experts with regard to urban forestry, but this is an issue where we need to do this in order to improve the land and allow the existing trees that are going to remain to thrive. Uh, we hated taking out trees, but we have to do it in order for the health of the other remaining trees. Maybe, maybe a couple of other points on the longevity. Kurt. I think that's an important question. Um, excuse me, Kurt Wozniak, uh, but because you know we we were spending a lot of money to redo this course and, and improve it, and we want that to last a very long time. So as Andy mentioned, the irrigation system um, the piping technology has changed. It went from PVC to HTPE, and which lasts, 
50 years? At least 50 years, yeah, told longer than that even in many cases. The, the tree um, work that we're doing is intended to make sure that the existing trees last longer. Um, we've already had um, many uh, Monterey pines die on our course. Almost every Monterey pine is gone over the last five years uh, because they reached the end of their longevity. So they tend to live 25 to 30 years and we've lost many, many Monterey pines, um, probably 50, I would guess. Yep. They've just fallen over. Um, so the tree um, thinning, uh, many places where we have um, trees that were planted uh, 15 feet apart, they really should be 25 feet apart. So we're beginning to thin groves where there might be 10 trees together, we're gonna take out three of them. Um, so to improve the longevity of those trees, but also uh, diversity of the trees. You know, we don't have a, we, it, we have so many redwoods, we're still gonna have 900 uh, or so redwoods in the place. Um, so we, we're definitely not getting rid of redwoods, but we're increasing the, the genetic diversity of the trees themselves. We're gonna be putting uh, cork oaks in, valley oaks, uh, live oaks, um, western sycamores, which are native to this area, um, and some, and not that many, but some Monterey uh, uh, cypress. Um, uh, so uh, the, the, those are the other aspects, is planting things that are going to last a long time. Uh, we're gonna also be changing the, the, uh, the grass as well, because we've had um, tremendous problems because of the amount of shade uh, that we have um, uh, on the whole course, we are subject to a lot of diseases uh, of grasses that we currently have. So we're gonna be changing the species of grass been a lot of improvements in genetic, um, and uh, uh, Chad Twaddle can talk to this for hours, um, about the, the new um, species of grasses that have been bred. So we're gonna be changing the species of grass to also improve the longevity. Uh, we definitely don't wanna have to go through this anytime soon. I make one other statement about the trees. The, um, the way that the ordinance is written is that there's a mitigation value that's established on each heritage tree. Um, when you look at that mitigation value, we have a responsibility to replace uh, trees uh, based upon that mitigation value. The mitigation value on the project is $780,700. We are spending $1,150,000 on the replacement and addition of the trees um, of the, the 208 uh, that we're talking about. So we are 2x of the mitigation value as required by the ordinance. Thank you for all that helpful additional detail. Um, Jim Chair Harris, I'll go with one more question and then I'll turn it over to, to my colleagues here. Um, and I'm actually not certain whether this, through the chair, this is a question to staff or to the applicant. Um, there's a reference to the San Francisco Public Utility Commission um, also being in the process of assessing this development work and making a decision about a permit. Um, could I, I would like just to better understand what criteria they are looking at um, in terms of under, in terms of determining permit permit or not permit to, to permit or not. So a, um, a hedge hedgey pipe that runs through the golf course. There is an easement that they have with regard to the hedge hedgey pipe. Um, we have an application into uh, the San Francisco PUC. Uh, we've done site walks with them. They understand the plans, and we expect to be able to get uh, full approval from the San Francisco PUC for the project. They just want to make sure that there's nothing that is planted, no buildings or anything that's over their right-of-way in case they need to get to the pipes to do uh, any type of repair work or replacement. And so far, we've adhered to the um, uh, current right-of-way and easement that we have in place with them. Thank you. Uh, I think I saw Commissioner Doe's hand next. Um, thank you, my, um, Acting Chair Harris. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Um, I just want to acknowledge the public's concern about the trees, which, um, and um, 
the the presentation, Mr. Duncan, that you gave, I, I also wish that that had been in the um, staff report agenda packet. I think the information provided would have been helpful to myself and to community members. And um, and to Ms. Headley's point about process, and this is not a criticism because you mentioned the extensive outreach, the meetings, the hours, the site walks, 100 people. Um, but yet outreach is always like, if you could just reach everyone in the area that is affected or cared, and that is a very tall ask. Um, but for me, I, I, I can empathize with community members because I'm one of those people who to, to read that 258 trees will be removed that are healthy, that are not dying. It's a tough number to swallow, although the presentation today was very helpful. And Mr. Davis, you're very very effective um, three minute explanation that redwoods um, are very thirsty and they are native to this to the area but not necessarily to the geography of the site that's all very helpful but um, I think it's just this is just a long-winded comment to say um, it's hard for for us for community members to become to truly understand the complexity of trees and um, in in a short amount of time <laughs> but not not a criticism, just the challenge of how to communicate something of so much importance and interest to a, an entire community. Thank you, Commissioner Doe. I appreciate your comments. Um, well stated, uh, Commissioner Riggs. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I have to agree that uh, Commissioner Doe's statement was uh, was right on. Um, I also expected, frankly, al although I do have a rather long background with trees, I expected this to be, um, frankly, a more difficult meeting. Um, it's a lot to ask to approve over 200 mature trees, um, and it is well over 200 to be removed. Um, but I have to say, between the staff report and particularly Mr. Duncan's presentation, um, the case is very well made. And one can understand and be on board that this is a project of necessity. Um, there were plenty of mistakes made in planting uh, both civic and um, club locations. <clears throat> and um, many of us know that um, redwood trees need fog. Um, they are um, a little bit altered in how they live once they find a lawn. Uh, things go a little bit screwy. Um, they grow awfully fast. Um, it is by no means only this club which has um, planted redwoods too close together. In fact, I dare say it's rather rare that people leave enough room between um, trees that grow to this size. Um, so on so many levels, um, I, I have to admit, I, I find this project is needed. It's well formulated, it's by all means well intended. Everything from the water storage to the water conservation to the long-term outlook on trees. Um, and there will be difficulties. Uh, there will be construction, although I hope uh, in the traditional manner of contractors, they will knock off at 4 o'clock, not at 5 o'clock. Um, <clears throat> and give some peace to the neighbors for what will be a challenging six months. Um, and then neighbors, uh, particularly the HOA residents, will have to endure the fact that their trees got smaller. It's a little bit of a time warp, but they aren't being moved all the way back to 1962. Um, some rather... Uh, well-sized trees are specified in this project. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I might come by just to see some of the deliveries. Um, 
because when a 72 inch box is delivered, it is, it's a little bit of an event. And there are quite a few of them, as I understand it. So um, I am glad that uh, members of the public came out to challenge the issues and that we were able to hear some response. I'm particularly um, swayed by the fact that uh, the local Audubon Club and particularly the Sierra Club, which refers to this as a needed reforestation, are behind this project. <clears throat> I'm left without really any questions to ask or any challenges to make. Um, so at this hour, I'm willing to put forward a, um, a motion to adopt a resolution and approve the use permit and architectural control, et cetera, for this project. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Um, the, oh, I'm, uh, Commissioner Tate, I, were you seconding or did you have some comments? I was seconding. Okay, so can I, before you second, um, I, um, I was prepared to second, however, um, I just wanted to have the applicant talk a little bit more about um, preventing the, the errant golf balls for the slicer um, over to the street level and um, the concern about the new trees that will be going into that area and how those new trees are going to prevent the golf balls going in when they are more bushy at a lower level, but not as tall. So if, if just a quick um, explanation of that, I think would be helpful from the applicant. Thank you. Yes. So I believe that, that the issue that you're bringing up has to do with the netting that we have on our current driving range that uh, where occasionally we will have golf balls that will fly over that particular netting um, into uh, a, the adjacent homeowners association uh, building. Uh, we currently have um, a 50 foot net up on our driving range. As part of the outreach that we had with the community, we found out that they were concerned about, uh, more concerned than we thought about these balls and we've actually come back and have put into place um, an action plan to actually increase the netting on the driving range, the height of that netting by 25 feet up to 75 feet um, as part of our trying to make sure that we're meeting the, the needs and creating a safer environment. The other thing that we're doing with regard to the renovation of the golf course is we're actually reconfiguring the driving range to be able to provide a little bit more space so that we can eliminate the um, potential of balls going into the homeowners association. So it was our intent to be able to come back uh, to staff after we got this approval completed and, and apply for a permit to um, install a higher netting uh, on the driving range. Um, we are happy to commit to that now as part of the project. We don't want to do anything that would hold up the start of the project for April because it's, as you know, it's very important for us to start on that date. Uh, however, if the planning commission or staff wanted to make this project and us increasing the netting um, a condition on something like, um, you know, final permit, um, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, final inspection, excuse me. Um, we think that that would be good because then that'll give us time to get the drawings in to the city and get it uh, approved and get it completed before uh, the final inspection. So I believe okay. that's- So thank you for that. I actually was more interested, thank you for that explanation, but I was more interested in the golf balls that are going on the street that goes through, I think it's the third and eighth yeah. Um, holes. Oh, yeah. Second and eighth holes. So, Sorry, uh, second and eighth holes. Right. Kurt, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. I just was going to mention that um, one of the reasons we like those smaller, bushier trees between going onto the street in between is they, they tend to block balls. That's where the balls 
occur. If you, if you have a giant redwood, nobody really hits up that high, so uh, they're intended to help block um, balls going to the street. There's also other places on the course uh, we were, where we are planting um, pretty large uh, oaks to block any errant balls, um, particularly around, our, around Trinity Drive um, area. Uh, which is our third hole and a couple other places where we're, we have to make sure uh, that we have these uh, 60 and 72 inch boxes placed correctly to help block balls. So. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much for that explanation. Let's get back to the dais and we have a first on the table from Commissioner Riggs and I think we have a second, um, assuming we still have the, the second from Commissioner Tate. Yes, you do. We do. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other um, comment or questions before we move to a vote on this um, application? Okay. Seeing none, um, let's take a vote um, on Commissioner Riggs' uh, motion to adopt a resolution to approve the use permit and architectural control per the staff report. Um, Commissioner Doe. Uh, I'm abstaining. Okay, Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Schindler. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Oh, yes. Okay, and I'm also a yes, so that's four in favor, um, one abstention, and we have one absence, so the motion passes. Uh, thank you so much to the applicant and staff um, for taking us through um, this, this, this presentation and this project. Okay, um, it is now um, 9.30. Um, I'd like to propose we take a five minute break before we come back to um, our study session G1 on the O'Brien Drive project. So it is, um, let's say we'll come back at 9.35. Okay, thank you. Okay, welcome back. We are now um, ready to embark on uh, item G <clears throat> study session for which we have one item G1, a study session on 980 to 1030 O'Brien Drive. <clears throat> Excuse me. A request for a study session for a proposal to demolish two existing one story commercial buildings and construct a new three story life science research and development building with a ground floor commercial space in the LS Life Sciences Zoning District. The project site currently includes four legal parcels with four existing buildings. Two of the existing buildings, addresses 980 to 990, and 1010 O'Brien Drive would remain. The proposed total gross floor area of the proposed building would be approximately 61,901 square feet of R&D space and 5,787 square feet of commercial space. The development regulations would be calculated across the entire project site for instance, the gross floor area, parking, et cetera. The total area of R&D and related uses inclusive of the two buildings to remain would be a floor area ratio of approximately 0.55. The commercial space would be an additional floor area ratio of approximately 3.7% beyond the 55% allowed for R&D uses. The proposed project is anticipated to include the following entitlements, architectural control, use permit, below market rate, BMR housing, in lieu fee, and environmental review. The proposed project also includes a request for hazardous materials, diesel fuel, for an emergency backup generator. <clears throat> Additionally, two of the four parcels will be merged to allow for the proposed building. Okay, so do we... Uh, so if, if I could have staff um, suggest how we proceed, I maybe a staff report and then a, uh, a an, uh, presentation by the applicant. Is, is that um, what's on the table for this?
to staff. Acting Chair Harris, uh, yes. are you can hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, staff would like to make a presentation on the project and we'll uh, uh, have a slide that indicates how we would like to proceed with this study session. Terrific. Um, good evening, everybody. Once again, um, this is a study session for 980 to 1030 O'Brien. No action will be taken on the project tonight. Uh, tonight, staff and the applicant team would like to introduce you to the project and receive feedback on the proposal. Next slide, please. So the recommended format uh, for this uh, study session is that staff will provide with a brief introduction to the project. There will be a presentation by the applicant team, uh, some of whom are here in person and some of whom are joining us virtually. We will uh, then take any public comments, then proceed to commissioner questions and feedback. Next slide, please. So a quick overview of the project and its location. Uh, the property is located north of the 101 interchange along O'Brien Drive between Willow Road and University Avenue. It is zoned as LS, Life Science Zoning District. Parcels immediately to the east and west are zoned as LS as well. Parcels to the north are zoned as LSB, which is Life Science Bonus. Parcels to the south are residentials located in the uh, city of East Palo Alto. The project consists of four contiguous parcels as marked on this slide. Next slide, please. So this is a rendering showing the front of the proposed project facing O'Brien Drive. Uh, based on the orientation mentioned in the staff report, this would be the northwest corner. More details about the project will be provided under the applicant team's presentation. Next slide. So the anticipated actions for this project, as uh, already mentioned, would be architectural control, use permit, environmental review, below market rate in lieu fee, agreement, lot merger, and heritage tree removal permits. So topics for consideration for the planning commissioners, um, however, this is not limited to the list um, down here. Uh, some of the topics that you may wish to consider are open space, publicly accessible open space, commercial use, gross floor area, architectural design and materials, building modulations, and overall approach. With that, I conclude staff's presentation. We do have the applicant team uh, here in person as well as virtually uh, to take any questions and also to present their presentation. Thank you. Please go ahead with the applicant presentation. Hi, good evening. Uh, thanks for hosting this study session for 1030 O'Brien. My name is Steve Reller. Um, I'm one of the owners, and along with my partner who's uh, on the Zoom call, Mark Marini, um, we're excited to present this project. We've, uh, we've purchased these projects over the past, I think, six or seven years. Um, I think 1010 was first, then 980, and they just came up, um, you know, every year, basically, until 2021 um, when we were able to purchase 1020. So that... Uh, that got us thinking we should have a project here. So um, a couple couple years ago, we 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 started working with Brick Architects um, to come up with the design. We've been working with staff diligently. Uh, we've had uh, outreach to adjacent neighbors, to our our closest neighbors in East Palo Alto, and a few other stakeholders. We didn't we didn't hear back from anyone on that, but um, we reached out to everybody. Um, and so here we are tonight with what I think is a really beautiful building for O'Brien Drive. Um, but I'll let uh, Brick take it from here. Thanks. Um, good evening. Uh, thanks for hanging in there. So my last name is Zirkel. It starts with a Z. I am 
used to go in last all the time. So I know it's item G and maybe there's more to conclude, but uh, sometimes with the last name that starts with Z, you end up playing to an empty room. So uh, thank you for hanging in. Uh, so I'll just walk you through quickly um, some of the aspects of the property. Uh, next. So just to, just to orient you, Fatim did a great job of sort of um, telling you where this is. This is at a, a really good uh, confluence of activity, obviously, and taking advantage of the, of the life science zoning and uh, the strength in that market. This is a great place to think about reinvestment in the property. Next. Um, <clears throat> highlighted here are um, the, the four buildings, 980, 1010, 1020, 1030. Uh, we've highlighted the 1020 and 1030 buildings, which um, are intended to be raised to make room for the project site. So the entirety is highlighted there in purple. So it's a campus of ultimately three buildings, two existing and then one proposed um, along the length of O'Brien and also straddling a residential uh, neighbor to our south. Next. Um, just to remind you of what the general look and feel of the neighborhood is. It's populated uh, next with low slung um, industrial buildings, predominantly uh, concrete tilt ups um, on the site and throughout uh, the neighborhood as well. Next. Um, so this just gives you a sense of sort of what's there. Two of them are fully leased. That's the 980 and 1010 building and the other two, as I'd said, are going to be demolished. Next. Uh, so I want to just touch on the features of the site design real fast and then I'll kind of give you a couple of highlights of the architecture and that'll be that. Um, so next. Uh, so this is just uh, an amalgamated drawing of street elevation on O'Brien and, uh, you know, kind of a more proper um, site plan that sort of shows the, the boundaries of the properties and the individual buildings themselves. You'll see, generally speaking, that O'Brien to the top of the page is screened by the ground level of the property with the lobby, which is the primary entry into the building, some commercial office and a, a small bit of uh, screening at the entry plaza to conceal the parking um, um, towards the south of the site. The, part, the, the building, as you'll see, is about 90. There's a small little typo in there. That's actually 89 feet to the property line. So it's about 89 feet from the face of the building to the property line for the residential neighbors to the south. Next. This is more of an illustrative close in of the project area. So you can see the attention to detail around the plaza, uh, both at the entry and the right, how the streetscape sort of blends into how one perceives the front of the building, and then how all of this together helps sort of conceal uh, the covered parking at the ground level and the surface parking towards the rear of the site. Uh, you'll see we're planting 27 uh, new trees, providing some landscape elements and uh, towards the bottom of the property of the page, which is the predominant way that the property slopes is where we have our stormwater filtration uh, solution there along the southern line and a couple of little spots toward in some of those parking islands to the bottom of the page. Next. Uh, so there is, and I'll get into the form of this in a bit, there is also a roof deck um, on uh, the accessible off the third level of the building that helps us create a step back. Again, we're 90 feet to the closest, well, 89 feet from the closest edge of the building to the residential neighbors, but this sort of torque in the upper floor actually pulls the building farther apart still to create a nice little terrace that's accessible to Southern Light, um, but also helps scale back from the residential neighbors as well. Next. Uh, we do have, uh, for those of you on the commission that are interested, um, I have a series of slides here that give uh, a summary of the planting plan and landscape approach. We do have our landscape architect uh, on the call, Todd Lansing from Creo, can answer any specific questions you have about the landscape palette. So why don't we just cycle through a few of these here just so you can kind of get a visual sense of sort of what the look and feel of the palette is. Next. Next. Um, okay, next slide. So, um, Commissioner Riggs, you may remember, uh, it was a little over four years ago, we got 725 Oak Grove, now addressed 1200 
chestnut uh, entitled and built and leased now. It's across the street from Coffee Bar. You and I had a really fun conversation about how we applied the massing modulations and the entry design requirements in the in the downtown plan. And I've always had that in my mind. And when I thought about the next chance I get to design a building in Menlo Park, I was going to sort of think about how we might further the thinking of what those kinds of form-based regulations are intended to create. So what's on the right is a summary of what's in the code in terms of the length of facades that are available, the modulations and setbacks that you need to provide. And so what we were trying to do was come up with a really simple movement plan that could create forms which better the intent of what the zoning outcomes were supposed to be. So instead of creating minor setbacks and minor modulations, by taking that third level and torquing it a bit, we created two little fun outdoor spaces, created some space between us and the residential neighbors. But what we also did is created an interesting interplay of that part of the building which comes forward and that part of the building which recedes back to create some really interesting modulation in the facade that we think goes a long way to not only meet the spirit but exceed the spirit of what's in the code here. Next. So here are a few renderings that sort of show how that works. So that third floor tilting in the uh, way that you saw it on, this, on the, uh, the illustrative rooftop plan creates a stepped entry, an outdoor plaza, and a primary uh, forward-facing front door for the building. You'll see the lobby itself is sort of a nice little uh, double height experience there that sort of acts at that hinge between the second and third floor. Um, and when you look up at the underside of these soffits, you'll see that this is a clear cedar, right? So it's a really natural and warm material to look at from the sidewalk. And that torquing of the floor plates actually gives that sort of level of modularity and modulation that gives us the ability to use that material in a fun way and create a real statement along O'Brien. Next. Now this is on O'Brien looking back in the other direction. And so again, one of the other benefits of that sort of torqued approach to the third floor is, is that viewed from any corner, the building changes and morphs. So it's not a static box on the site. It's actually something that feels quite vibrant and quite alive. Um, and, and also is a practical way for us to provide usable outdoor space for the tenants, but also create moments at the ground plane that are interesting. What you see here is the, um, the landscape palette in the foreground, but the commercial space at ground level that in part helps shield the, um, the parking at the southern end of the site. But it, it looks very different from the other end of the property too. So we feel like it's alive in this way. Next. Uh, this is a view <clears throat> on the south side, uh, to where the southeast looking northwest. Again, you really get to see that moment where if you're in the parking lot, this is where it pulls you in towards the front door. Next. And then at the other corner of the property, um, our, our neighbors, residential neighbors are to our right of this frame. And then we're looking back about how that torque on the third floor actually does create that step back that I was describing. Uh, that gives way to the uh, terrace of the third floor, but just helps us recede a little bit from our neighbors as well. Next. Uh, this is a view from above that sort of encapsulates the overall massing and form of the building and how it plugs into the neighborhood. So from a scale and look and feel standpoint, we think it plays with some of the, you know, strong rectangular geometries of those industrial buildings are there, but puts a little twist quite literally to give it some interest and purpose. Next. A uh, very simple palette of materials. This is um, a unitized glass curtain wall uh, with bird, uh, bird safe glass throughout. Um, <clears throat> uh, also variegated composite panel. Uh, I did a, a, a project in Palo Alto nearby. Some of you may have seen at 385 Sherman. It's uh, a visa is a tenant in that building, so it's off California Ave. Uh, we use the material there that we're proposing here. It's called Fiber C. It is a glass fiber reinforced concrete panel, so durable, nice, and it also has some uh, tone and texture differences that you can get in the manufacturing of that panel that helps bring the surface of the wall to life. So it's not uh, flat looking, actually. It actually has a lot of richness to it. And it's a panelized rain screen system, so it's actually quite a, a, a good and capable facade material as well. So those elements of the stair towers and stuff that you saw there. Uh, that's where we're using that. And like I said, on the underside of the soffits, we have clear cedar. Next. 
Uh, and just real quick here, just to sort of show you that how everything sort of comes together before I sign off next. Um, again, commercial space and lobby facing O'Brien, um, uh, sort of, let's say, widened sidewalk and, and uh, public plaza towards the front that faces the commercial space. Entry plaza with some very interesting landscape forms, benches, seatings, planting that our landscape uh, architects on the calls come up with. Loading to the back, parking to the back. This is a very friendly and forward facing uh, proposal we feel like. Next. And then really efficient floor plans too. Surprisingly, even with the building that twists next, these are actually pretty designable, pretty tenable spaces too that we feel strongly will do quite well for research and development clients um, that will ultimately come in and lease this space. Next. And just just so you know we got a big there's a lot of there's a lot of equipment that goes with these things uh the building itself as it's probably noted in the staff report is 45 feet tall to the roof and we have an 11 foot 12 roof screen to deal with um uh all of the stuff that goes on these buildings next so that's all i got happy to answer any questions thank you Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I want to go to public comment, but before we do, I would like to give the commission a chance if they have any just clarifying questions before we move to public comment. Um, I'd like to hear those. Okay. Um, seeing none, let's go to public comment on this item. Do we have any attendees who are interested in speaking? Yes, thank you, Acting Chair Harris. Um, once again, if you would like to give public comment, please click the um, raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you're participating via Zoom, um, if you are participating in person and would like to give public comment, please fill out a comment card and hand it to me. Um, we will start with the online commenters with Lynn Bramlett. Lynn, you'll have three minutes to speak, and you should be able to unmute yourself now. Good evening again. Um, this project looks very beautiful on the surface. However, I think we need to better understand as a community the risk to the public through hazards associated with these kinds of facilities that are, and I'm talking about life science, that are not addressed in the safety element, the environmental justice, or the municipal code. And I think the city council, commissioners, the public, I think we need a, a deeper education about the risk. Yes, of course, there's an upside, but there's also a very tremendous downside. And I speak based on some information that has come uh, recently as part of the Sierra Club focused uh, seminar on the topic and my own beginning to understand this mark. You know, I, I admit this is new, but I think we all can recognize even with COVID and, you know, kind of the still continuing discussion as to how that brought about, how quickly something could be out there in the public domain and causing uh, lethal damage. So based on my my uh, preliminary looking into this industry, it may not necessarily be all that regulated. I mean, yes, there are regulations, but that doesn't mean they're followed. So I think there is a very serious potential risk, and especially when these are located in near residential neighborhoods. Uh, East Palo Alto was mentioned. It's also in District 1, which, which already has risk just due to the development, the high density, um, the soils, et cetera. So um, I ask as part of this, if this is being proposed, and there was nothing that I saw in the staff report about the industry itself and any of this background detail, I think there should be a much, much deeper conversation about this. Um, before these projects advance, because once they advance, I'm based on, again, my preliminary research, and there's a lot more I want to look into here, um, we may not be able to kind of ro roll that permit back later on. 
So I think all that ought to be um, considered and a lot more done. And I probably will follow up with you with a deeper memo on the topic. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Our next speaker will be Pam Jones. Pam, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Good evening, Interim Chair Harris, uh, Commissioner, staff, and uh, presenters. This is Pam Jones. I'm a resident in District 1, not too far from this project, as well as all the other projects that are um, about to happen in uh, the same area. Um, I sent in a comment, but I have, as always, a couple of more questions or concerns. And um, uh, so, so, for example, um, what is the purpose um, or the benefit to this project by merging the buildings? Which leads me to the next thing, and that is um, the daylight uh, impact. I'm only 358 feet from 300, uh, three hundred three three story uh, building and I no longer can see the sunrise. My entire east eastern uh, view is um, is gone. So I wonder what's going to happen to all these people along Alberni, Alberni. Um, the outreach, I know it's a challenge, but how was it done? Did you consider um, doing uh, uh, door knocking or at least hangers or flyers to the residents? Things that are mailed, text messages do not always re reach the attendee. And text messaging or, or emails assumes that everybody has a smartphone um, or a computer. Um, so the other thing that I'm wondering, and this is along the lines of, uh, of Lynn Bramlett, and that is um, the hazard, the waste hazard concerns. Um, we know that East Palo Alto and that uh, the Bellhaven portion of District 1 has traditionally had the um, highest impact of, of um, hazardous waste as well as the impact of, um, of traffic. So it would, I think that we really need to look at that and we need to look at that in concern, in looking at all four of the projects are over there doing projects in isolation doesn't give you any information. Um, again, thank you for allowing me to speak and, and for the hard, hard, hard work that, that you are doing as a commission. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Our next speaker will be Naomi Goodman. Naomi, you should be able to mute yourself now. Thank you. Uh, you heard from me once already this morning, but I'm chiming in on another issue. Um, we have heard a lot about the appearance of the building, which I have to say is a very nice looking building, but nothing about what the building will be used for. I'm concerned about the lack of city control over the potential risks from life science R&D. Um, you've likely seen several emails from me recently regarding a recent webinar on biosafety levels for life science facilities. The most recent email included a link to the video. I really hope that you'll take the time to watch the webinar for better understanding of biosafety levels and how they're used to evaluate the risk to people and to the environment if a release of a hazardous substance occurs. Four biosafety levels are defined, BSL 1 through 4, in order of increasing requirements to prevent harm to humans and the environment through release of a living organism. I'm not an expert in biosafety. I'm learning along with you. However, it is clear to me that allowing a large number of biotech facilities to be sited in a high liquefaction hazard zone adjacent to dense residential areas in Menlo Park and East Palo Alto requires an extraordinary degree of caution. It's not sufficient to simply issue a use permit as there's no assurance that the risk will stay constant from one research project to the next. This issue is confronting every city on the peninsula, from South San Francisco to Sunnyvale. On March 7th, the San Carlos Planning Commission made the decision to ban BSL-4 level research entirely and to require BSL-3 labs to apply for a conditional use permit and to undergo annual inspections. You can see a, a report of this in the uh, San Mateo local newspaper. 
I urge the committee to consider placing a temporary moratorium on approval of any additional biotech projects unless the applicants agree that no BSL-3 or BSL-4 research will take place. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. I do not see any additional hands raised at this time, and I do not have any in-person comment cards. Okay. Thank you. I think we've given enough time, given that it's we're getting later in the evening. So I think we can close public comment and bring this project back to the dais for comments from and questions from commissioners. Uh, I know we. I don't. Please, please uh, let me know who would like to start off on this project. Okay, well, while the commissioners are anticipating their, or thinking through their questions and comments, um, I know there are a lot of things that were brought up by the callers, and I, I appreciate all three callers for hanging out with us so late and, and making um, their comments. <clears throat> I wanted to ask a question uh, just about the process of merging these properties. Um, it was a little bit surprising to me that we are going to merge the four properties um, together really for the sole purpose of increasing the gross floor area um, and parking. And I'm just wondering, is that how we, it, what is the precedent for that? Um, is this only allowed in the Bayfront? Is it allowed other places um, given that of the four properties, two of the, the buildings already exist. So it's not like they need all four in order to tear down and build one new um, development or one new uh, building, but it's really just taking those, taking the allowances for the two buildings that are gonna exist and placing and adding them over to the other two uh, in order to build the, the new building. And I'm just wondering from staff, what is what is the precedent for that, and and how um, how how does that become allowable? And for this project specifically, how much more um, gross floor area is allowed because for for the new building because of this merger? If I may um, answer your question. So we have had, um, I guess to back up a little. So this is possible for any zoning district to use un, um, unused or underutilized development potential. Um, it's not just for the life sciences zoning district. Um, we have seen this in other projects. Uh, we have seen this for Menlo Portal and Menlo Uptown as well, where they have used um, other you know, development potentials uh, from their, uh, their neighbors. And it's, it's possible through a deed restriction. And for the second part of my question, what is the increase in gross floor area ratio for this new building based on what is allowed for the other two buildings? So um, to answer that question, I did quickly try to see what the lot size would be when lots uh, 10, 20, and 10, 30 are merged together. The lot size approximately would be uh, 92,400. With that, they would have a maximum FAR of 55% for non-commercial use, which would give them about 50,820 square feet and an additional 10% for commercial use, which would be 9,240 for a cumulative total of 60,060 square feet. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, 
I do have a number of other questions, um, but I wanted to first um, acknowledge the applicant. Um, I do think that the building is very attractive and I like, um, I like the unique modulation um, and the texture and the panelized system. I, I really, I like, I think it's a good looking building. Um, there are just gonna, I think gonna be a number of um, questions that don't necessarily have to do with the building itself, um, but have more to do with um, the overall project, uh, at least from, from my opinion. Um, so who, who else on the commission would like to um, start us off on some questions or comments on the project? Uh, Commissioner Doe. Oh, did I get that right? It's so hard to see who's no, you're who's fine. I think going I, out quickly. I do think Commissioner Schindler was a few seconds ahead of me. Thank you, Commissioner Doe. I, I would love to just have the opportunity to build on the exact question um, that Chair Harris asked, because I also have some clarifying questions trying to understand um, the approach of, of using the allocations associated with four parcels specifically in the development around those two buildings. Um, so thank you for clarifying um, that it was a deed restriction um, that was the mechanism for handling this. Um, my question, I'll, I'll try and sort of lay out a few questions and then pause. Um, so my understanding then is that it would not be, if because it's a deed restriction, it wouldn't be possible to dissociate um, the units, the, the, the four parcels going forward. So these things are, are merged in perpetuity. Um, I, I guess I'll just ask the first, that, that is the first question. Is that, is that correct? If I may, yes, that, that is correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, so through then, the chair, I'm, oh. I'm sorry. I just want to provide a clarification. So the two parcels are merged in perpetuity. The other two parcels are just transferring development rights and then deed restrictions for those two parcels would prevent them from um, trying to use the development rights that they have transferred. So overall for the um, for existing parcels or three proposed parcels, there would be no increase in what um, like gross floor area they're allowed overall. Thank you, that's, that's, a, that's a helpful clarification. So for the, the parcels that have not merged, right, where the existing buildings are remain, they can't reclaim their development rights, um, which means they essentially cannot expand any additional square footage. Is that correct? If I may, that, that is correct. Through the deed restriction, they wouldn't be allowed to expand. Okay. So if, if there were a renovation, um, that would be permissible so long as there were no increase in square footage. That is correct. Okay. And in those instances, the same requirements for open space, and for publicly accessible open space, because they're percentage based, those would those would still apply to the two other the two other parcels that are not being developed at this point. Is that correct? So there's, there's a requirement about, let's say, 20% of the, of land being publicly accessible, and 50% of that 20% being, sorry, public being open space. 20% being 20% of the project site area being open space equivalent and 50% of that 20% being publicly accessible open space. Does that requirement still apply to the two undeveloped parcels? The open space requirement would apply to the existing two um, properties. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think th those were my questions, um, Chair Harris, that specifically built on your initial question. Um, I'd love to hand it over to, to Commissioner Doe to, to sort of run with the next line of questioning. I do have some more for later, but go for it. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Schindler. Um, Chair Harris, that's that, that's okay. I'll, I'll go ahead with my questions. Um, I, um, as the three speakers alluded to, um, I did happen to watch that March second webinar, and I would agree with their comments that I, I, that was the beginning of my education of life science, 
um, and, and what hazards it holds for the community. And I do agree that it needs to be um, a, a much bigger discussion. So I won't say too much on that because I'm still learning <laughs> on on all the um, what that entails. And um, but just want to acknowledge that that does need to be a bigger discussion. Um, so I, I had a question about the um, relationship of the building to the neighbors. You, there's that lovely rendering of the buildings just glowing at night, which is lovely. But I'm also just wondering if um, maybe neighbors don't want a glowing building, glass box glowing at night when they're trying to sleep. And so just wanted to, to ask the applicant um, on um, community outreach and also life science is it different from other building uses in its hours are the lights on more often i mean this is clearly a taller building three stories it's glass so i just want to kind of understand um this relationship with the, the the neighbors immediately to the um south of the project We did send letters. I don't have emails or phone numbers for all those neighbors, but um, you know, in the letter we ex described the, the project and offered to have individual meetings, um, and just didn't hear back from anybody. So we're not we're not sure how they feel about it. Um, we just haven't heard back. Um, in terms of hours of operation, I don't think it's any different than a regular office, um, but it probably not all the lights on. That was just to make it look beautiful, but who knows. <laughs> Thank you. And, and along those lines, um, there's some commercial use on the ground floor. And um, maybe this might be a question to staff. I'm just how that commercial use, how is that determined? Is that like community serving retail? And I know that this is not um, like a bonus level development, so it's not required. But I'm just curious on the process of um, determining what that commercial use is. Is, it, is there any obligation to make it um, serve or respond to the community needs, or is it just um, not? If I may, since this is not a bonus level project, uh, we cannot uh, provide a list to the applicant from which they can choose. Uh, it is up to the applicant what they would like to place in that commercial uh, area that they're proposing. Um, thank you. Um, I did have one more question about the, um, I've heard this many times before, but the, uh, the use of fossil fuels in the buildings. Um, one of the about a year ago one of the first buildings um when i first started serving the planning commission it was uh, also a life science building and that's where i learned that there was a um exception to the all electric new construction rule for space heating for labs um, and i did see in the staff report that this that this project will also um, intend to use natural gas for the space heating um, and given that it's been a year i just wanted to check in technology changes and um, through the chairs wanted to check in with the applicant to see um, just just push a little more push back on that is it is it possible these days to use um, the all electric construction for for lab space heating um, just like to to pose that question <laughs> uh yeah no it's a it's a great question um and, and the answer is, is that it's evolving uh, technology. So the, the, the thing that drives the, the gas for the, the purposes of the labs is wholly dependent on the number of fresh air changes that are needed to maintain a clean environment. So just as an order of magnitude, it's about 8x more than a, the standard changes for an office building. So it means that you have to have relatively robust machines running to be able to move the air around at a rate that creates the clean environment that companies involved in cell and gene therapy 
BSL one and two um, in the language of the previous callers. Great questions, by the way. Uh, the the technology isn't readily available or readily uh, effective at meeting those needs. So the exclusion um, uh, that we would seek under the reach code is uh, to buy something that actually works and is maintainable and purchasable and, and serves the functions. Uh, you know, that may change in through the years, but what's available now um, is, is best ran off gas from an energy efficiency perspective. Does that make sense? And it's, but it's driven on the fresh air changes per hour. That's yes, where that comes yeah. from. It's the Thank volume you. of air that needs to move through. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I, I'll just make one more comment on the architecture um, since you presented that. I just also wanted to say I think it's um, a nice design. I like the the twisting of the building massing and how it's um, where the twisting happens. The um, the wood kind of becomes that soft human interface at the um, soffit and the entries. Um, and then just this really small comment, I think the stair towers are clad in an opaque, that cement fiber panel, and, and it's clear that you have a very distinct contrast between glass and the solid. I'm just curious if you would consider some slit openings to let some visibility and light into the stairwells, just a, um, but just a small design observation. consider it um, so as drawn it's a concrete building so we've got shear walls running in that direction so mo most of the opacity in those stair towers comes from the structural work that those things need to do so we're somewhat limited but i agree with your sentiment that getting a little light into the stairwells would be a good thing so if we could make it work structurally we'd be open to it for sure Okay, are there more um, questions from commissioners? I have some, but I, I wanna make sure that I've reached all of you um, to the extent you want to speak um, at this juncture. Um, Commissioner Riggs, is that your hand up? It is. Okay, Commissioner Riggs. I have to note that I like Commissioner Doe's concept of uh, slits between the panels for lighting. I hope that works out. Um, <clears throat> I am. Um, I'm going to look at the six categories that were suggested by staff for our feedback. Um, starting with open space and publicly accessible open space. I'll have to admit, I'm not highly critical in this category, particularly in life sciences. Um, I just don't see this as a place that people are going to take a bus down from Redwood City to hang out. Um, but having said that, I think I think they are uh, pleasant spaces, and they're certainly okay in my in in my view. And we may end up seeing. Um, uh, uh, developed graphics in the future. Um, commercial use, I'm rather curious, and through the chair, I'd like to ask the applicant, do you already have some ideas? Um, is this going to be Coffee Bar East? Um, uh, or are you just um, hoping some uh, small retailer will um, come and want a space here in the life sciences area? Yeah, so the answer is we don't know. I mean, it would be uh, presented to the market and we would be obviously limited to those uses. Um, but at this point, we don't, uh, we do not, we haven't identified a particular type of use other than what we're limited to. Fair enough. Good luck with that. Um, next bullet item was, uh, has to do with the gross floor area. And um, I, uh, Back during the <clears throat> formation of uh, Connect to Menlo, we came up with the idea of being able to transfer developing developable area. And this is how it's used. And I think this is a good way to use it. It means that we can continue to use rather than demolish um, two useful buildings. Um, 
and and the landowner doesn't lose developable space. So this is what it should be. Um, some thoughtful comments have been made about uh, the nighttime visuals uh, of a building that is three commercial stories high, um, not that far from residential. And um, I remember when the first Geary Facebook building was uh, framed and had an exterior finish on it, just what a mass it presented, uh, just walking down the um, streets in Bellhaven that terminate at the railroad track. Um, and therefore you had this view of, um, of the, those huge walls. In this case, I think it might be a little bit more amenable that it is glass, um, but I would have to agree you aren't going to be thrilled if the janitors happen to be scheduled for 2 a.m. and do what janitors do, which is turn on every light in the building because they're not paying for it, uh, and then spend their four hours cleaning. Um, so it might be considerate to um, think about what hours, at least the second and third floor building lighting uh, is controlled. Um, architectural design and materials, um, I agree with my fellow commissioners. Um, it's quite a nice um, use uh, and a nice palette of materials. I'm already looking forward to seeing how the entry is developed. I guess that's on the east corner. Um, hoping that there is a fairly profound contrast in uh, tone um, to really feel that cut, cut away um, from under the second floor. I'm also hoping that the second floor dominates as the outline of the building, which I think it will. I can't help but be a little self-conscious of the mistake Menlo Park made 40 some years ago in permitting the Schwab building on El Camino, um, which falling out of the grid and being close to the street turned out to be a mistake. Uh, I don't think this is going to be that problem. <clears throat> and then regarding the um, carefully made point regarding the building modulations, um, I certainly think this works. And I think presenting this um, is just as valid um, as other forms of breaking up a uh, facade. Um, particularly since the one facade that really runs through the length is something like, I'm guessing, 30 to 45 feet up in the air. Um, I think this will work nicely. And um, in terms of overall approach, I don't know exactly how that's intended, but this is certainly the kind of project that I think is a, a nice addition to the life sciences group. So leave it at that. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Um, I guess I'll, oh, do I see a hand, Commissioner Tate, or did you want me? Okay, <laughs> two hands, Commissioner Tate. Thank you. Um, I think it's a nice looking project also. I am uh, definitely, uh, concerned like uh, my fellow two commissioners about uh, the nighttime lighting uh, because you are directly in folks's backyard in the rear of their house. Um, so I, I hope too that you uh, really put some thought into that instead of just, you know, that it was just to make it look pretty because I'm sure you're going to want to have the lights on because it is a pretty building, you know, illuminated some sort of way. Um, but um, I know it wouldn't be appreciated by the neighbors. I live down the street from Facebook and it totally changed everything on my street. Like it's, it's like, uh, 
it lights up the whole entire block. So I could just imagine if I were um, in the apartments that are just right, you know, right there adjacent to uh, to the building. Um, and uh, I was also interested in the whole thing about the merging the parcels, so I'm glad that has been addressed. And um, let's see if I had anything else. Oh, so just to clarify, um, on the rear of the building, um, in the, the balcony there, and I saw the umbrellas, and, um, it is far enough indeed away not to be looking right over, peering into someone, okay. Because that was a concern. So I was very happy that it was 90 feet away from the fence. That's great. Um, I believe that's about it for me. Thank you. Um, and that is the noise or ordinance. So um, from what I understand, I read was that the equipment, it'll be below whatever the decibels are. Is that correct? Did I, I saw that? Okay, so um, have you also taken into consideration whatever East Palo Alto's ordinance is? Um, because those are your neighbors, the folks in East Palo Alto. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, if I could ask the applicant to step up, I can't, I can't see head nods or yeses from the audience. And I want to ensure that. Um, to acknowledge the Commissioner uh, Tate's comment about uh, what the standards are in East Palo Alto because we have an adjacent property line. This is a great point. We hadn't considered it. I would assume that it's probably somewhat similar in terms of noise transmission. So, but we'll definitely double check the acoustics uh, report that we've got prepared for the project just to ensure that it complies there as well. That's an important relationship there, of course. Absolutely. And um, you've heard earlier, you know, our going back and forth about the decibels. That's like a huge thing that's right there at people um, people's homes when they're trying to sleep at night. For sure. For okay. sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Tate. Um, I can't see the dais. So you could thank you. Uh, Commissioner Schindler. Thank you. Um, I, I did want to just ask a, a follow up question to the applicant and then a follow up question to staff related to some of the, the um, bioscience levels and the webinar that was addressed that was was has been referenced both by speakers and, and by uh, Commissioner Doe. I also saw that um, and I know that this is um, early in the planning process. Um, there are still many questions still to be answered about um, tenants and some of the nuances and the details. Um, but I wanted to just ask if there was a presumed level um, as we've just referenced, it goes sort of one through, I'm gonna assume it's one through three. You're not, we're not gonna do any four here. Um, is there a, pre, a presumption about what kind of tenants would be, what level the kind of tenants would be at? Uh, Biocides one, level one or two or three? One or two, Okay. not three or four. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, and then again, I like others who've referenced it, I'm expanding beginning and expanding my knowledge. So my question to staff is um, for projects like this, um, which local or regional government body is responsible for regulations and enforcement um, of public health guidelines that would apply to this location? So for example, procedures related to experiments that involve bioagents or animals. I'm just I'm new enough in this thinking about this that I don't know where the city, the county, or the state, and what agency um, has has responsibility for for these types of questions that are being surfaced tonight. If I may, through the chair, so hazardous materials um, require an admin permit with the city, so when the tenants have been selected, they would need to go through the admin permit process in order to occupy that space, depending on the level of hazardous material that they will be using on site. And this would be reviewed by the fire district 
as well as the uh, county. Thank you. So in that definition, uh, if I may, um, hazardous material, how does hazardous material relate to um, bioagents and the various components of experiments, including chemicals, bacteria, animals, um, reagents, things like that? I don't necessarily consider those to be hazardous materials. They're scientific materials. They're elements, critical elements in doing research. Are they included in the definition that and the regulation that you were just talking about? If I may, um, I am um, not 100% sure uh, about the uh, all the items that have been mentioned, but I do know that the chemical list is something that the fire district does uh, definitely look up on. Okay, thank you. I think I will want to know more about this as we progress, whether it's this particular project, and it's not just this project, but I think um, the kinds of questions that the community has raised um, and um, that I have based on initial understanding uh, will bear further questioning and I will want to better understand, for example, who enforces certain safety protocols um, and who has responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, that was my met my biggest question. Um, I actually wanted to <laughs> go back to where I should have started, which is just to say thank you for coming earlier in the process. Uh, thanks to staff and the applicant for being here at this point um, for a study session. Um, it's great to have a chance to look at the development and react to it and give some feedback um, now and know that we'll have an opportunity to do it again in the future. Um, the commercial space has been brought up a couple of times. Um, I will just ask a quick question that connected it back to where I started. Um, because not the full 10%, I think 10% of allowable space, 10% uh, of space could be allowable for, for commercial. Given that this proposal is sort of three and change, three percent and change of that space. Does the remaining seven percent, seven-ish percent of commercial space, could that be applied to any of the other parcels? If I may, through the chair. Um, so the 10 percent commercial would be for the merged property only. Okay. So if they were considering to uh, expand and utilize the remainder of the 10% that they are allowed, they would need to utilize it within 1020 and 1030, O'Brien. Okay, thank you. Um, if I may, I would like to clarify Commissioner Schindler's question. Um, I believe the hazardous waste is regulated through the fire district and life safety, uh, and um, a commenter had mentioned liquefaction, that would be all taken care of through the building uh, permit as the building code regulates all, that, all those. Um, okay, I, I, it, certainly I think there are, based on my exceptionally limited knowledge of the physical requirements of lab space, um, that sounds like a great answer for now. Um, I think the question that the community started to surface in their initial comments was about understanding experimentation and the nature of things that happens when science, bioscience experimentation happens, not necessarily during the building process. Um, things about I won't, I won't rehash. I think that was the, the gist of the question. So I think that's something that we should just be sure is, is publicly discussed and um, vetted so that there's a, a broader awareness of that. Um, my last question and, 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 and feedback is just please um, to the applicant, thank you for starting the community outreach process. Um, just to please as your process proceeds continue and deepen the community engagement process um, creatively through multiple phases, multiple channels, um, just trying to make it as, as dynamic and open as possible. 
um, so that we have a wealth of, of confidence the next time you come back that we've heard all of the, the things we might not think about because we don't necessarily live in the neighborhood. Um, so, thank you. Through the chair, I just want to make a clarification. I think um, some some of the commercial permitted square footage would still remain for the for the other parcels. I don't believe that's all used up on the um, for the new building, but we can we can look into that a little more closely. Thank you. Okay, um, I have some questions and thoughts, but I I want to um, honor. I saw Commissioner Riggs that your hand went up in the middle of. Do, do you still have a question or a comment, please? Yeah, I have a comment. I I can help out a little bit. It, it occurs to me as I look around the room that I think I was the only one in this venue back when the Planning Commission used to review hazardous material applications. It was a real nuisance and uh, we worked uh, across several years to move that to be an administration review, administrative review, but <clears throat> I can sort of dig up uh, what the elements were. Um, an item would come before us for hazardous materials and it was always in the life sciences district um, and we would routinely go through to check that the building department had signed off the um, sewer district county health and the fire department and they all had to have checked their slightly different forms in the right place. I believe the most important review in terms of the questions you are asking is the county health department. And so I think what we might ask is that uh, if staff might clarify that the county health department looks at, I know that they look at the function of the lab and the lab has to be certified and they get inspected but uh, the degree to which they look at the product uh, that is being used because certainly since somewhere around december 2019 we are all just a little bit concerned about what goes on in a lab Oh, thank you. For as long as I've got the microphone on, I did skip over three or four things earlier. And if you'll indulge me, maybe two or three minutes, I'll do that. Um, I wanted to note in terms of the architecture that I appreciated the um, clear sense of entries, because we do from time to time get a building that practically calls for a, a monument sign out there with an arrow on it. And that's always the greatest embarrassment, I think, to an architect. Um, and <clears throat> there was also the issue of um, gas heat discussed earlier. And I just wanted to note that um, I have through um, mechanical um, with um, other labs, um, come across the same issue that it really is necessary um, for the volume at this time. And I also can't help but note that a lab can be a more serious place to lose power than say um, a conventional office building. And two weeks ago to have been without, I mean, I threw out everything in my refrigerator. I do not want to think about what goes on in the refrigerator of a, of a lab after 48 hours. Um, so there are definitely some uh, utility differences there. Just my two cents. Okay, thank you. I think that most of my questions have been brought up. So I only have a couple things and then I'd like to close this discussion in a few minutes um, so that we may finish by 11 o'clock. Um, 
I definitely have a hard stop at 11, but I think it seems very doable. Um, I, I also have the issue with um, just understanding what the impact is gonna be to the neighboring homes. Um, I was pleased to find that the setback is 89 feet. Um, that was gonna be the biggest question I had and the fact that the parking is in the back. Um, but I don't have a sense for um, what the what the folks immediately in East Palo Alto next door are going to be able to see and what um, the folks in the top of the, the new building are going to be able to see um, into them. So I think when you come back, explaining and showing that is going to be helpful. Um, and as far as the outreach, this has been said before, but it's going to be, we are going to expect you to have spoken with and met with um, the folks who, who live in the immediate uh, vicinity. <clears throat> and there are a number of different ways you can um, try to reach them. And um, I think that you're going to need to employ um, more, more ways um, because we're going to want to make sure that they are fully engaged. Um, the other there were a number of things that were brought up that haven't really been brought up as much before. We talked about um, BS1, BS2. I was heightened. I was glad to see we don't have any three or four. I don't know how that is um, ma like mandated um, within um, the project. So I'd like to figure out how we can do that. We also don't really spend a lot of time talking about the fact that all of these buildings are in the liquefaction zone and that um some of them are even in the high liquefaction zone and so the um robustness of the foundation that can withstand a higher force resulting from an earthquake beyond the force that would be required for a non-liquefaction soil um, is going to be really important and i i guess i have a question to staff do we i realize this is more in the building phase but do we have more robust requirements um for building development that happens in our liquefaction zones than we do not in the liquefaction zones. Um, it looks like most all of the properties to the east of 101 and many, a few properties from to the west of the 101 freeway are in that zone. So um, from staff, if you could talk a little bit about what the requirements are for buildings that are um, the foundations in, in those in those areas. If I may, so those would be looked at, as mentioned, uh, during the building permit stage against the building permit uh, or building code, rather. But I guess my question is, do we have different requirements for buildings that are in these liquefaction zones? Yeah, so the during the building permit stage, that would be looked at whether it's in a liquefaction zone and those types of life and safety um, concerns are reviewed. So it's not it's not one size fits all. Um, the location is a factor. Okay, so I would say when this project comes back, I, I understand we are not the building department, but I want to have a sense um, given um, Given the delicacy of building in this part of town, I would like to have a sense um, and feel confident that what we're doing here with this project um, is going to make sense, not only because we are in a liquefaction and maybe a high liquefaction zone, but we also are putting in, it's, it's a, an R&D facility, so there's more of a concern if something were to happen in an earthquake situation. Um, I think that's um, about all that I have. I know that long-term we're gonna be looking at parking and I'm gonna be asking you to reduce the parking. So to the extent that you can take a look at that before the next time you come back, it might be something you wanna consider. Um, and that's about all I think I have. Again, I'd like to thank the staff and the applicant for the presentation today. I know we all really, um, 
enjoyed seeing the, the beauty of the building. Um, and I know that a lot of these other comments um, are not necessarily um, about the architecture as much. Would any of the other commissioners like to make any final points before we move on in our agenda? Everybody feel like they've been heard. Okay. All right, in that case, um, I'm gonna close the G1 and move on to H um, for um, announcements from and, and uh, coming up next, I guess that we've got two meetings coming up. Ms. Sandmeyer, would you like to expand on what we expect to see in those next two meetings? Uh, yes, um, so for March 27th, the notice has gone out. Um, MPCC will be bringing that item back uh, with the requested denial findings. Um, we have 120 Constitution Drive, and that's a small architectural control application, and 1145 Hidden Oaks, and that's a single family home. Um, for April 10th, we haven't we haven't set the agenda yet. Um, there are some larger projects coming up, um, such as the 1125 O'Brien Drive uh, draft EIR and study session. And I'm sorry, I missed um, one project for March 27th. Um, we will have architectural control permits for Willow Village. And that concludes my updates, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Perfect, thank you. Do any of the commissioners have any questions for Ms. Zanmeyer or anyone else on staff? Okay, I see two. Um, I think I saw um, Commissioner Tate's hand first. Commissioner Tate. Oh, yes. Um, I have a question um, to staff about uh, noticing for the MPCC. Um, so on the notice, did it lists that there is an alternative uh, site to participate in the meeting? Or is it just the standard notice that goes out saying that this will be discussed? Yeah, I don't believe we'll have an um, alternative site. Basically, this meeting is um, was just an opportunity for staff to draft the denial findings and then review them with the city attorney and then um, bring them back to planning commission and the, the 300 foot notice did go out again. Okay, so, um, so there won't be a remote site this time, thank you. Also, um, I know like a month or so ago, there had been an issue with uh, the email box for planning commissioners and it's been brought to my attention that several folks have sent emails to that mailbox and they haven't arrived to us. So I don't know if maybe there's a, the weather has caused another glitch or something. So is this the planning commission, the, the main address? Yes. yes. Okay. So I don't know, maybe, maybe we better take a look at that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and Commissioner Doe? Uh, yeah, thank you, um, Chair Harris. I, I had a question to staff, um, kind of similar to Commissioner Tate's question about location, and, and I, I don't know if there is precedent for meeting the Planning Commission to meet anywhere but the City Council Chambers, but I was just curious if there's interest from the community or the my fellow commissioners about meeting um, in other parts of the community, such as, you know, the Bellhaven Library, I, if, if especially if there's a project that's relevant to the community. Um, I, I appreciate the work that staff did to make that happen last time, and, I, and, and um, I'm just curious if there's precedent slash possibility of doing that to make um, meetings just more accessible to other, all folks in the community. Yeah, I think it's it's possible to um, hold meetings in other locations, planning commission meetings. Um, of course, the location needs to be included in the um, public hearing notice on the agenda. Um, but yeah, we can certainly look into that. And I think there's been um, some discussions on that already. 
And then um, through the chair, if I could provide a clarification on the Willow Village architectural control items going on March 27th. Please. Um, so those are for office, meeting and collaboration space in the town square. Um, it's not for the residential portions yet. Hmm. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. And I would agree that if there are opportunities for us to hold um, the planning commission in the Bellhaven area, the community center, when um, when the majority of the agenda is about projects in that area, I think that would, would make some sense. Um, and that's, I think, oh, Commissioner Tate. Um, I just wanted to comment on 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 that, and and not necessarily that it is the majority of the agenda deals with um, that neighborhood, but any major projects like the Willow Village stuff is definitely um, yeah. item that should be over there. But you know, generally it's just one item, and um, that impacts uh, you know big item. Okay, thank you. That I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you for that clarification. I agree. Okay. If there are no more questions or comments, I'm going to adjourn the meeting with four minutes to spare. Okay, okay, <laughs> we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.